My name is Crystal. And my name is Grey. And this is Rubbish and Probably a Podcast, a Good Omens commentary podcast where I, someone who has seen the show too many times, and I, someone who only knows this show True Crystal, discuss every single episode of Good Omens. For today's episode, we are discussing Season 1, Episode 2, The Book. It's the book! Sure is. I think it's fascinating that in the episode, The Book, I yeah. have begun to feel an inclination to read The Book, Good Omens. <laughs> I, I think, because last episode, mm-hmm. I think I talked about, like in the podcast, I talked about how... Like, it's a book, uh, like, the TV show obviously comes from, like, a source material, but it still feels fresh and original and blah, blah, blah. And the the more we go through the story, I am now more and more curious how, like, the source material looks. Like, what did they add? You know, how did they modernize yeah. it in a way? Because, a lot of it is what did they subtract also. Really? Yeah, okay. Last episode... Mm-hmm. We spent most of it in like a flashback in a way. Like we're not in the right now of the story. But now we are in the right now of the story. So like now more than it did last episode, it matters when the now is. And Mm -hmm. I am curious how they presented now in the book when the now was like in the 90s. Was this written in the 90s? Yeah, yeah, it was written in, yeah. or published in 1990. Versus, like, how now is in, you know, 2020 or whatever. This is 2019, right? Season 1. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I just assumed that their now was still the 90s or, like, the 80s or whatever. Because, no. because I don't know, like, the look is of, like, it certainly doesn't look of the now like you know the buildings Mm. or whatever i mean i don't really know what maybe that's london London. who knows like maybe london just looks like it stopped forever in the 40s 50s 60s 70s (laughs) or 80s but but, i don't know london really is it well may be a 40 or 50 year old man it is the 40 or 50 year old man of its time and place exactly. and locale. I had this thought when Anathema brought out the iPad. And I was like, <laughs> oh my god, she has an iPad. That's crazy. Yeah. And she literally does have an iPad. And she does. I was like, oh, so we're in modern, modern times. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't recall exactly what they did to modernize it. I think there are bits. I don't think it's like enough to warrant reading the book. I feel like if you want to read the book, it's to see the original Aziraphale and Crowley characterizations, which are slightly different from the shows, um, but which I care about deeply enough that any slight differences mean a lot. Um, I mean, you've been on an audiobook kick recently. There's like yes, two audiobooks true. for Good Omens. So once we are done with season one, you are free to go about that at your leisure. Yeah, I mean, I am also on a Dostoyevsky <laughs> kick right now, so maybe, you know, maybe it'll take some time, because that book is fucking long. Well, both of them are so insanely long, it's unreal. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to hit us with the synopsis for this episode? Oh, yeah, I do do that. <sighs> oh, by the way, mm-hmm. is Good Omens the entire six episodes written by one person? Is it real? Yeah, it's literally all Neil just... Gaiman. That's interesting. Because even for shorter shows like this, there tends to be more robust writing themes, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just that he wrote the book. And also, I feel like he stated that he considers the TV show to be sort of like him his like, baby. carrying out yeah. like his and Terry Pratchett's vision. So. Yeah, he doesn't trust other people with it. That makes yeah. sense. That does actually makes sense. Oh, you know what else I found out today? What? So, I I knew that Terry Pratchett is British. Terry Pratchett's British, right? I think. So, I think I don't know why, but like I've always known that in a way. I don't even know Terry Pratchett. I've never read any of yeah, his books, but nor I. I just I just always assumed 
you know, <laughs> like <laughs> I just always thought it was British. Anyway, mm. um, prior to knowing about Good Omens and prior to watching a clip that you made me watch like a month ago, what I didn't know that? that a Good Omens was British. Well, you made me watch the kissing scene. <laughs> when I was not in my right mind. The whole thing? I mean, whatever it is they could put in YouTube immediately after <laughs> the episode aired. I watched it, and it was like it was like a video that's like, you know, like the coloring was bad. It was filmed one way or another uh-huh. through a phone or whatever. Like, okay. it's a fun video. Anyway, <laughs> I watched that, and I was like, oh my god, they're British. <laughs> And but Wait, I didn't so they know they talked and stuff and everything. Oh god, I've ruined yes. our entire lives. Okay, continue. No, you even told me like there's no like nightingales or whatever. Like there's oh no my birds. god, what a dumb fucking line. I hate when shows are so no, exactly. You told you told me that. Yeah. Okay. So, well, anyway, Great. my point is they started speaking and I was like, oh, they're British, but yeah, I just always assumed that Neil Gaiman was American. And I always assume he lives in the U.S. mostly. Okay, I always assumed that Good Omens was an American show, and then I learned that Good Omens is British, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, that's wonderful that Neil Gaiman, an American guy, <laughs> went out of his way to do a lot of research to, like, you know, write." In right, a right. He really book. got Brit picked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And today, I was, you know, thinking about it, and I was like, is that even true? <laughs> so I googled, and um, Neil Gaiman is, in fact, um, an English writer, as um, Wikipedia puts it. Yeah, yeah. My, sure I don't know, I feel, I feel betrayed in some way. <laughs> uh-huh. This is the first betrayal Neil Gaiman has done to me. Yeah, yeah, one of many. I'm sure there well, will be more in the future. Yeah, well, we'll send him to accent training class. We'll we'll get that <laughs> Britishness sucked out of him. No, because like, I yeah, I don't know. I just I was like so enamored by the idea of like writing for a different locality. Like mm. I always thought that's very cool. We see him like, writing for a different locality <laughs> briefly in this episode, and he did not do his research. <laughs> that's true. So yeah. Oh, the synopsis. I'm supposed to do that. So the Real? synopsis is Anathema Device and Newton Pulsifer enter the picture as the final race draw nigh. Azura, Phil, and Crowley continue their quest for the correct Antichrist in the hopes of averting Armageddon. They sure do. Very succinct. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this episode, a lot of it is set up. Mm hmm. A lot of it. Like, we spend a lot of time with people we haven't met before, introducing them, introducing their lives. It's just, here's a human, here's their gimmick, watch them gimmick about. I watched this episode twice. My first watch, I found it so insanely boring, the first part of the episode. (laughs) And then, you know, when Azuraphil and Crowley show up, I'm like, okay, we're back to the thing. But um, the way the episode plays out, Towards the end, like, I actually was like, oh, it, like, feels much more powerful when um, Aziraphale ends up with the book because you know where the book has been yeah. and what it has been through. And when I rewatched the episode, I was enthused the entire way. Nice. Like, the entire episode I was into. So, I don't know, like, I mean... Something that I don't like about TV shows is that there's so much set up. Like, mm-hmm. you need to invest so much time to then invest even more time. But, like, I think this episode does it well enough. And it's really, it's really effective at it. Yeah, yeah. I do enjoy the, the setup as long as it's interesting, which I think it is here. And then it's nice to see everybody cross paths. We open in Soho on Thursday, two days to the end of the world. Gabriel and Sandolphin pay Aziraphale a visit. Um, I do think <laughs> that this scene is so funny, it's unreal. John like, Hamm 
I love him. I've I've already waxed poetic about John Hamm, but maybe I should do it again. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he'll yeah. he'll hear you and come on our podcast. Exactly. <laughs> He's American. <laughs> There's your American involved in good omens that you want so bad. <laughs> But, yeah, so basically, there's, like, customers browsing, and they're, like, Gabriel and Sandalfin are like, how do we get in the back room to talk to Aziraphale privately? And instead of asking, they just both are like, hi, we want to buy a, a thing, a book. Yes, okay, we want to buy a book, and um, we have to talk about it in the back because it's porn. <laughs> and... And I don't, I'm so yeah. amused that they're like, oh, this is so effective, and humans are so stupid, <laughs> we just trick all of them. And Aziraphil is like, you sure uh, did, buddy. Yeah. That yeah. sure is what happened. Right, yeah. Specifically, Sandolphin says something like, oh, we humans are easily embarrassed, so we must buy our pornography secretively. Which I think is fun as, like, uh, so angels aren't, like prudish about sex or anything is yeah. the idea right like lust isn't inherently a sin blah 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 blah. whatever just buy your porn and open dude i also like you know it's a nice insight to the whole like a zero fail knows oh, yeah. how to be human so significantly more than his other angel counterparts yeah gabriel doesn't even remember the word for book sandolph and has to correct him they go to the back room and you know, uh, Aziraphale is introduced to Sandalfin, and I just love how Sodom and Gomorrah is, like, shorthand for, like, this is an angel who's mean and bad. Yeah, like, this is an angel who killed so many people. Don't they do something similar with Uriel in, in Supernatural? Supernatural? Yes. It's definitely implied yes. that he did Sodom and Gomorrah, at least. Like, when Cass was, like, being lobotomized, I think Sodom and Gomorrah was brought up as something that was erased out of his mind or something. So, like... They s- prevented him from being gay? Or they, they prevented him from knowing about homophobia? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah, a uh, book fact moment. Uh, I really enjoy a time when they mention Gomorrah in the book because, okay, it's like, Aziraphale and Crowley are talking about how they're, like, both so, so screwed... And Aziraphale's like, I too am screwed. And Crowley's like, oh, come on. Like, you guys have ineffable mercy and stuff. And then Aziraphale goes, yes, did you ever visit Gamora? And Crowley goes, sure. There was this great little tavern where you could get these terrific fermented date palm cocktails with nutmeg and crushed lemongrass. And Aziraphale goes, I meant afterwards. And Crowley goes, oh, what a fun moment to me only. (laughs) Sandalfin says that something smells evil in the back room, which, love the idea that Crowley just goes around emitting evilness as a scent. Yeah. Personally, I think it's his Axe body spray. Gray, <laughs> as a perfume guy, what, what do you think Crowley would actually use besides Axe body spray, of course? I think, honestly, he would be a dumb Ford guy. Like, he loves that, like, you know, like, look at his car, look at his outfits. Mm-hmm. He loves that kind of, like, old, classic, sophisticated bullshit. I don't know if, actually, if Tom Ford is old or classic or sophisticated. It's definitely expensive. Mm. But... Yeah, Crowley seems like the type to just find the most expensive possible perfume and then not pay for it. And then wear it yeah. just knowing that he didn't pay for it and that it's the most expensive one. Yeah. But, you know, Xerophil makes a joke about Jeffrey Archer, who is, he was supposedly, he's a conservative politician who was in jail for two years for perjury and also wrote some best-selling fiction. Yeah. I asked my British friend about this, if, like, she has any special insight on this guy, and she was like, I don't even know who that is. And I was like... Well, she said, like, I think it's a writer, but I don't know anything else. And I was like, I think he was in the parliament and also he was in prison. (laughs) And she was like, I literally don't know that. And also, I'm so shocked that you even know (laughs) anything about this guy. Well, yeah. 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 I don't know. It's not like, I guess, in the consciousness of people our age, like 20s, 
So I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that tracks. Um, so Gabriel's very enthused about how everything's going. He's like, you know, it's all going to according to the divine plan. We've got the Hellhound. We have the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> who are death, pollution, famine, and war. But yeah. uh, he doesn't know who summons them. Yeah, he says he outsources it. Very fun. And then Sandolphin has this moment where he's like, you know, it's like I always yeah. say, you can't have a war without war. And, like, Gabrielle is so enthused about this. Yeah. He loves this joke so like, much. Oh, my God. That's like, so good, man. Yeah, he was like, I could make, like, a slogan out of this or something. <laughs> and, like, even as he walks out of the thing, he was like, wow, you can't have war without, without war? war? Man. What a smart guy. God. But, yeah, they head out after shouting... Thank you for my yeah. pornography out of the door. So real. Yeah. I think it was in this moment that I thought to myself, Crystal loves Crowley so, 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 so much. Mm-hmm. So I think a part of me was expecting to also love Crowley, like, a lot more than Oh, no, you know, I Aziraphale. mean, Aziraphale is, like, my specialist little princess also. I like him so 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 much more significantly than i do crowley i get it he is endearing in a way yeah that crowley he's like a frumpy old guy i love that yeah yeah no, crowley is fun crowley is really really fun and i do love Thank him you. and like i think he's a very fun character but mm-hmm. like there's something about Aziraphale that feels like he was made for me. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, he tickles a part of my brain that I feel like, oh, like, okay, this guy is, like, the target audience for this type of character is uh-huh. in my general area. So. Is it the... Huh. I'm trying to think. Okay, let's see. Which friend do I like I that he really tries like... to be nice. Yeah. And he has, like, a whole, like, oh, I'm... I'm, I'm better than that, like, mindset. Yeah. And, like, I like that he's, like, I don't know, I like that he's kind of ugly. Like, he's so frumpy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we cut to Crowley's apartment in Mayfair. Uh, what do you think about the set design here? I think it's interesting that Aziraphale is in a very homey, very comfy, like, his home base is the bookshop, and... Mm-hmm. They really go out of their way to make it as cozy as possible. Yeah. And Crowley's place is literally just like, it's also there. <laughs> like, it's also a location. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Like, he has the Mona Lisa drawing in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right. the they plants, cut out of course. The yeah. scene in the book and also in the show of like Crowley and Leonardo da Vinci hanging out. Leonardo da Vinci being like, man, I could get her smile right in, like, this one that I'm giving you, but, like, the one I'm actually painting, like, she looks like shit. Her husband's gonna hate it. It is obviously built to look ominous or whatever, Mm. but I love that um, the way it comes off to us is more of, like, Crowley doesn't really gaff about this. (laughs) I should stop saying that. Stop saying the oh, oh, he really doesn't really give a fuck. Okay. I was yeah. like, is there a definition of like the word gaff that I don't know? I'm obsessed with saying it. He literally the gaff. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the gaff about his living space. Yeah. Um we find out in season two actually that like he didn't buy this place. Like, this is provided to him by hell. Like, this is company housing that he's just had for centuries. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's his college dorm. (laughs) It's literally his college dorm. At least I put posters up in my college dorm, but I guess Crowley's posters are the original Mona Lisa. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And he has the plant room. That's something. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the plant room scene was very, like... I don't know. I did you think it was in character for him to be so ferociously? It was a bit much. I've read meta about it, so I'm sure you did. <laughs> it's 
Yeah, we'll get That's to not it. A thing. We'll get to I'm just it. saying. I know. That just I am like, sure yeah. You did. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that is different between or this and the book and the original TV script is that his apartment walls were supposed to be white. Like, it's supposed to have like more of like a model home, unlived in, like modern day, like oh, realtor vibe. Doesn't maybe that doesn't translate in visual. Right, like, like maybe the they were worried it would going for here. look too much like heaven or something like that yeah. if they did that. So instead they were like, let's go back to the old color coding so his walls are like dark gray marble and all that shit. And he sits on a fucking throne. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Which I think someone's pointed out is the same prop as the throne that Crowley and Supernatural sits on but repainted and like if you look at the carvings it is in fact the same chair well I mean for sure Good Omens took that from Supernatural because Crowley yeah, and Supernatural I think you're, shows you're, up earlier your theory that the some of the people on set design and props yeah. and stuff are Supernatural fans is Looking more likely yeah. by the day. It's also possible that it was the cheapest thrown on Amazon.com that week, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I find so fast because, like, basically, what happens in this scene right, is he gets a call from hell, and like what you said last episode, though, that like sometimes hell can't see him, like in the radio, but like in the television they can, which right. really begs the question. Is there a camera in TV? <laughs> I don't think there is. But yeah, it is how they do it in this thing. Yeah, I think it just is more of a like, we're hell, but we're fair. If you can see us, then we will also us, be able to we see, can see you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find fascinating that after he hung, because like the conversation is like, oh yeah, everything's going great. Don't even worry about it. And then mm. the uh, angel, I the, the, the demon goes like i don't trust you crowley yeah and like and basically like talks about how like oh this is something we've been preparing for ever since we fell Mm -hmm. and then crowley says like i didn't even plan to fall i just like hung out with the wrong people yeah i think there is some truth to me saying that if crowley was an angel he would act pretty much the exact same way yeah, I don't disagree with that. Like, he would, like, do good, quote-unquote, in the same way he does evil. Like, <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, funny and, like, um, kind of, like, multi-directional, and it's, like, oh, it's kind of, like, just, uh, it influences the whole world. Like, you know, like, it's, like, a massive net that he's casting instead of one specific person kind of s- thing yeah. and all that crap. Like, I think he would be, like, a fun... Like, he would act like this even as an angel. Mm. And I think that really brings up an interesting question regarding, like, what we were also talking about last episode on. The angels and the demons are meant to do specific things, but they are not representative of those values. He does evil but he isn't evil fundamentally and Azuraphale is supposed to do good but he's not inherently good like those are different things I agree but also I just think that just probably could never be an angel because like the restrictions of heaven and the whole like don't question things are like fundamentally against their nature so like yeah, no matter what, like, they were always gonna be a demon. Uh, what you said about Crowley not being inherently evil or whatever reminds me of a passage in the book um, where he's thinking about Ligger and Haster, and um, the narration goes, Now, as Crowley would be the first to protest, most demons weren't deep down evil. In the great cosmic game, they felt they occupied the same position as tax inspectors, Doing an unpopular job, maybe, but essential to the overall operation of the whole thing. If it came to that, some angels weren't paragons of virtue. Crowley had met one or two who, when it came to righteously smiting the ungodly, smote a good deal harder than was strictly necessary. 
on the whole, everyone had a job to do and just did it. So yeah, I think that your interpretation is what they're going for. Like, they're just doing shit. Like, yeah, that's it's their a job. job. It's, it's to work. balance things out. Yeah, I guess the question is more like, does Crowley regret falling or feel bad about falling? Which, this is a contentious topic, I think. Yeah. I think what's I, interesting is that yeah. no matter what, like, whether he fell or not, he is still tied to an alliance, mm-hmm. no matter what. Like, he is yeah. still tied to people, st- still has responsibilities. Yeah. And maybe it's less about regretting the choice or regretting the fall or whatever. And it's more of, like, resentment that no matter whether he fell or didn't. Mm-hmm. So pretty much the same. Like, yeah, let's have a very similar shitty job. Yeah, like he still has to answer for something, answer for someone, you know, all that crap. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I read this as more of a direct response to like, because we are the fallen, like, this is our goal and purpose. Like, I feel like she's more just like, well, I mean, I didn't really like don't opt gaff. into <laughs> He literally the gaff. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really opt into this ending the world business. I was just hanging out with the wrong people. Yeah. Literally, um, Crowley is like, you know, like when you're in college and you're like, oh, I love my fucking field so much. And like, I'm so invested in what we're learning. And then there's people in your class who's literally just there also. <laughs> like, yeah. he literally is also just there also. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Good for her. Um, yeah. Also, one more thing is that um, for Armageddon, the demons are planning to take Warlock to the Middle East, specifically <laughs> yeah. the Valley of Megiddo, My God. which is a valley in Palestine, um, which is the first time that the Middle East and North Africa features in this episode. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, on one hand... Like, using the words the Valley of Megiddo or whatever, like, maybe the idea is just, like, this is a biblical thing. Most of the Bible happens in the Middle East. Sure, let's take them there. But, like, this is such a British apocalypse. Like, the only angel and demon on Earth are both in London. And, like, both of the potential antichrists were born in London. And everyone is white as fuck. So it still feels weird for this yeah. son of a white American diplomat who worked under fucking Bush to take his white kid to <laughs> Palestine to end the world by starting a war there. Yeah, and it's not like a, oh, well, they're demons, so they're supposed to be evil, because I don't think it was like a, no I, I'm think thinking about the worst possible thing and, like, thinking about all the implications. I think it's just like a, well, that's the place where wars happen, right? And it won't affect yeah. my audience, who I assume are all white Westerners, so let's just shuttle them over there. It feels a little bit like a... Well, it's a scary place. And yeah, we're bringing him to a scary place, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, we get a, a lovely racism moment in the show when, or sorry, in the book, when like Warlock is actually in the Middle East, um, because they bring he... him. <laughs> they really do bring him. <laughs> sorry, Jesus that's Christ. a spoiler. I in the book. <laughs> It says that yeah. Warlock was having a strange couple of days, um, yeah. and he was he was like, it was probably something cultural. All that had happened was a lot of funny-looking guys with towels on their heads and very bad teeth had shown them around some old ruins. Bro, what the fuck? <laughs> That's what I think. What the fuck? Back in the day, do people just not know about other people? No, like, exactly. that's something I think about a lot. Because like when you know, when you read like old books and they talk about like foreigners is like, yeah. kind of like and ooh, they're they're so different. Like, have you <laughs> never watched a documentary? Did those not exist in the eighties? <laughs> I feel like they 
did. And I feel like people traveled. <laughs> like, you know, like people went places and met Paris people. Paris is Burning came out in 1990, and that's the oldest documentary of I've watched. <laughs> so they had the- Real. But yeah, I don't know. It's about like, right, not knowing that other people are people. And like, also, I think it's just like not thinking that other people could be part of your audience. Like, I feel like yeah. if you're like, oh, like, people living in the Middle East might read this, you'd be like, let's take that out. Yeah. Another book fact is that uh, the time in the book when Crowley thinks the, like, I didn't mean to fall line is when she's taking the Antichrist to the convent and is considering just throwing the basket out of the car window and <laughs> running away. Good for her. Good for her. Basically, we meet the summoner who's like a mailman and he's been tasked to deliver items to the four horsemen in order to bring them together for Armageddon. Right, so we're in a place in North Africa and there's like three political leaders under a tent signing a peace accord. Um, in the original script book, it says we're, like, in a conference room in North Africa, and there are three distinct groups. One group might be Iraq, one Iran, one Saudi, or one Indian, one Burmese, and one Chinese. It doesn't matter, as long as we feel they are from different neighboring cultures and we subtly color code them. Which is def definitely the vibe of the scene. Like, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this is somewhere else. <laughs> Wait, <coughs> that's a line from the book? No, that's a line from the, the script. Um, like, the original show script. That's crazy. Because if that was a line in the book, <laughs> I think that would be, like, a pretty good commentary of how we see, like, conflict, you know? Like, okay, fine. Yeah. But... If it was, like, in a script? <laughs> yeah, it was in the script. We're, they were like, okay, it's we're crazy. definitely in North Africa, but, like, maybe they're Chinese. <laughs> maybe they flew over here to sign this. Why not? I mean, China is a big country. <laughs> <laughs> they, they go all the way up there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fucking the Chinese That's government crazy. fucking wishes. Anyway. <laughs> God. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Chinese geopolitics, the country that you are. Also, I'm Chinese yeah. for the audience, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Um, and I'm Filipino, so. Yeah, which no <laughs> one sure could have guessed. Geopoliticking. Yeah. yeah me sure. and Crystal are solving um, Chinese Philippines geopolitics one podcast episode at a time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And they're all here to sign a peace accord. But then, like, it's like, War shows up, she's like a white woman with red hair. Yeah. And she introduces herself as a war correspondent. What's interesting to me, as you said, like, they, like, blind cast this show, right? But not War, because she is, like, a woman with red hair in the book also. Interesting. Is there, is there like, people... Like, what's the situation with the other characters? In the, the book, other horsemen. Like, um, there. In terms of like, no, not the horsemen specifically. Oh. Like everyone. Like the show was blind cast. Generally, is yeah. that true? I yeah, generally think so. But like, yeah. did they only blind cast the characters that were not specified a certain race in the book? I feel like not many characters were specified a certain race. Like I think it was really just war who like had red hair, which implies but doesn't yeah, require but you her can, to be white. You um, can have red hair. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, many things went through my brain upon my second watch of this scene. And one of them was like, well, this is certainly a moment where blind casting could have gone so possibly wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, if, yeah. So, oh, you, you're like, going to be so excited when you see the other horse. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was looking out for, like, what, for, like, something with the horsemen, because you did mention that there was something with the horsemen in terms of racism. So, like, I was, like, really, like, thinking about this scene when it was happening. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, 
I don't know if this is better or worse. <laughs> like, I, mean, yeah. I was like, okay. What would, what would be the, yeah. the, the really bad alternatives? Just, like, anyone well, can, who's not white. <laughs> no, like, they can have, like, someone who is from, quote-unquote, there. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Right, Which, from, like, no man's land, North Africa. North Africa, yeah. Yeah. So, that may be a bad look, but also... It is a little bit odd. It's that, also like, a bad look for, yeah, for this. For, like, the two people who are, like, main actors in the scene, like, the mailman and Red. Yeah, no, exactly. To be... That's my point. Like, yeah. <laughs> whatever way they do it, it's like, well, okay. And the reason why that is is because the setup of this scene is pretty much exactly how you described it in the script. Like... It's like, all of these people are accessories. Like, every yeah. single person who is not war and the delivery guy is an accessory. Mm-hmm. And the only two people who happen to not be accessories are, like, white and, like, majorly pointed out as not belonging there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It is an odd look. And I, yeah, I also just feel like... Like, if I was going to make a scene, like, parodying, mm-hmm. like, war and global conflict, like, I, don't, I feel like the go-to <laughs> joke is, like, look at the U.S. claiming that they're fighting for their countrymen's, like, freedom by going in to other countries and invading them. Like, this is such a lazy, like, well, you know what's a war-torn region? There. <laughs> Let's do it, folks. It's not that big of a scene but like i mean it is true that in western media it's such a prevalent yeah concept, trope to just yeah. yeah well let's shove the war-torn middle east and north africa <laughs> yeah. in there whatever yeah, they sure are in there they tour yeah. in this episode yeah and it's also the fact that okay so in the book in the um Warlock's birthday party. The deal there um, is actually that one of the kids gets a hold of one of the guards' guns, and then like Aziraphale panics and he's he turns all of them into water guns, and then like that's the big like birthday party throwing things around moment. And I think like Amazon probably stepped in and changed that because they were like. Oh, well, you oh, know, like, gun yeah, violence uh, and children is, like, a really sensitive topic in the U.S. right now. And, yeah. like, we don't want to portray that. That's too much. But, like, it's fine to portray, like, these people gunning each other down and dying in the background as yeah. war walks off smirking. Like, what a writer and what, like, a production company or whatever finds acceptable to show Yes. Says a lot about, like, how much sensitivity and care they put into things. And I feel like the fact that they were like, well, this isn't too sensitive of a topic. Because, you know, that's just how it is with those people. Feels odd. The idea is that because of her influence, they start fighting about who's going to sign the peace accord first. They're arguing, guns are being drawn, and then the postman shows up. And he's like, oh, I'm just a regular British bloke, eh? (laughs) Whole vibe. That's not even how, like, a fucking mail works. (laughs) But okay. (laughs) He works for the the International Express Company, so. Yeah, but, like, the International Express Company has subsidiaries in other countries. (laughs) Like, it doesn't, like, you don't get to be British and be, like, a British (laughs) worker. And then also end up in North Africa. Like, it doesn't usually work like that. And the way it's presented here is, like, it doesn't work like this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He seems pretty unfazed by the whole situation. He's like, anyway, here, um, war or whatever your name is, I have a package for you. And, you know, she's very excited about finally getting this item. Uh, and then she opens the box, and it's a big ol' sword, and she unsheaths it, and then goes, Alright, guys, I'm out! And as she walks away smirking, we hear 
a lot of machine gun Gun fire and like people falling down and dying in the back and then we get a few clips of like people in the overall village like loading up cannons and shooting and things so that's that scene and she's oh and also you know she's introduced as war and she's been waiting for 60 centuries to end the world blah 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 so book fact is that this actually this scene in the book takes place on a mediterranean tourist island instead of north africa and the deal is that there are four factions of people who are either pro Turkey, Greece, Italy, or Malta being like the countries who like have jurisdiction over the island. So like this was I don't know why that was changed. Like was there more like geopolitical conflict happening there when in 1990? I don't think so. Wait, you don't think so? Or maybe? Was it? I don't know. Was it? I don't know anything. 1990s meta. The only know the only thing I know about Malta, which is one of the places you mentioned, yes. is that Caravaggio was there um, towards the end of his life. He joined a knighthood. It was a crazy story. Nice. Um. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just needed to throw that in there. I'm obsessed with Caravaggio, as everyone in God knows in my life can't find anything on a brief google search but if anyone knows about history hit us up (laughs) yeah um and another thing is that uh in the book and in the script uh this is not war's first scene war's first scene gets cut but she is working as an arms dealer and she shows up at this city in africa or it might be a it might be a town or a village Um, And they don't specify which African country. Um, And then she's like, okay, I'm just going to start a war here for funsies or whatever. Uh, And in the script book, the the scene that introduces it, it goes, um, Exterior African Road, Day 2007. A dusty red painted truck rumbles along a dusty road that's little more than a track. African music, African animals, a beautiful establishing shot. (laughs) Yeah. God. Just, I, yeah. And later, it says, like, oh, an African passerby, like, says that, like, something's wrong with her car. Like, why, like, okay, man, <laughs> whatever. It's just the, it's just the whole, like, you know, like, who is your audience? Who are, what perspective yeah. are you writing from thing all over again? Right. Oh, also, last book fact is that, like, War's the only woman of the horsemen, and, like, it's solely so that part of her thing is that she's, like, so hot that everywhere she goes, men start fighting over her. So, like, that's, like, her war thing, and it's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... I think that's unfortunate. (laughs) Unfortunate, I would say. Yeah. What are the four horsemen? It's pest- pestilence, uh, it's, war, it's hunger, and... It's traditionally pestilence, but it's pollution in the Good Omens verse. Okay. And then, yeah, famine, war, war death. And... Oh, yeah, death is... Uh... I always found that weird. Why is death right. a horseman? Like, that's kind of just the result of the everything else, but okay. I was gonna say, like, I think maybe, like, if you have to have, like, oh, we need to make one of these horsemen women like for like a thing yeah. which I, I like the concept itself is a bit ridiculous mm-hmm. well a lot ridiculous but i think war would be the last one you'd choose just because wars are usually done by men or yes because the conception of war is not a particularly female oriented <laughs> you know concept yeah yeah I mean, in in the the British world that Neil Gaiman is operating in, women don't really fight in wars very often. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess they're trying to do something about, like, the seductiveness of violence. No, yeah, exactly. And it's like, <laughs> like the Helen of Troy nature of, like, uh, you know, like, oh, she, her face can sink, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, launch a thousand uh, ships or uh, some shit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not sink a thousand ships. That's so sad. <laughs> and 
unfortunate for me personally. Yeah. I just feel like there's not really a good way to go about the horsemen in general, I think, just because they're like Yeah. Their character is that they're representative of evil. So like no matter what like gender or like ethnicity you give the character, it's still gonna there's feel like gonna it's saying Barry. something. Yeah. And that something is mostly gonna be bad due to the nature of it. I think that I think that if there were more characters who were well written women or well written like whatever else other horsemen are, because I'm not spoiling that for you yet, like it okay. wouldn't be as much of a big deal. But yeah. because there are not and because we're working through a strongly white British lens for the rest of the characters, it's it's a toughie. We're at Lancashire, England, 1656, which, Love okay, that. later it says that the book predicted the next 350-ish years, so it could be, like, more 2016 in the show. We don't really know, but 2019 also works. 46 years after Caravaggio died, R.I.P. King. <laughs> oh, so basically the scene is... <laughs> No, I, I am enjoying the Caravaggio facts. Thank you. So, we are introduced to Agnes Nutter and Thou Shalt Not Commit Adultery Pulsifer. <laughs> you know, I tried to look up uh -huh. if people were actually named this way, and I couldn't find a legitimate answer. I don't know either. I didn't bother looking it up. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> It's pretty funny, and I love that. No, because, like, I think Neil Gaiman answered an ask on Tumblr about this. Oh, God, wait, are you and, also like, starting down the rabbit hole of reading Neil Gaiman's answers I did to Tumblr not. asks? Okay. I, I just want, I just read this one, and, okay. like, the I think the, like, the way, he, like, he has, like, ten siblings or whatever, and all of them are named in this way. Is that mentioned in the book? Because, like, it feels like a quote from the book, the answer. Yes. Actually, let me find that line in the book. There was covet... covet is, is it covetousness? Covet how, how do you... Covetousness. I think... I don't know, yeah. but, like, I know what the word you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah there's covetousness, pulsifer, and false witness, pulsifer. Um, yeah, but and, like, I find it, it so funny that it's, like, a common, like... Uh, like, in their family, like, all of them are like, you shall not commit this <laughs> bad thing. And then all of them just ended up being called bad thing Pulsifer. <laughs> I find that absolutely hilarious. It is pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, book fact is that um, Aziraphale collects misprinted Bibles in his bookstore and one of them that he yeah, has... Yeah, I've, I've also yeah. read this on Reddit. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Is... One of them is the one that's like, thou shall commit... Uh, commit adultery. <laughs> yeah, so real. We've got a witch hunt going on, uh, and the other people in the village are telling Pulsifer about why Agnes Nutter is a witch, and it's all stuff that makes it clear that she's sort of living in the future because, like, she's into jogging and acupuncture and getting more fiber in your diet. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Agnes is, you know, writing her goodbye notes because she's aware that this is when she dies. So, uh, they show up at the door and she's like, Hi, everyone. You're late. I should have been burning ten minutes ago, so let's go. And she ties herself to the- or helps them tie her to the stake and tells everyone, Hey, like, everyone, come really, really close to me, please, for no reason. Uh, and then they light her on fire. And then we get the world's worst CGI explosion. <laughs> yeah. Because and everyone around her also dies. And everyone yeah. around her also dies because she had hidden 50 pounds of gunpowder and 30 pounds of roofing nails in her skirt before she went up. Which I think Hell yeah. is pretty cool. 
unfortunately, in their explanation of this, they, like, show us flashbacks from literally one minute ago to, like, of, like, <laughs> of, like the gunpowder <laughs> in her room <laughs> and of, like, Pulsifer going, oh, booger. Like, <laughs> we just saw that. We literally just saw that. This episode is 59 minutes long. You could trim off some of the fat, man. <laughs> and we also learned that she left behind a box and a book. And the book was the author's copy of The Nice and Accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which she recently got published. So um, her daughter and, her, and sorry, her daughter and her son-in-law are looking at this. And, like, we just have the, like, most inane exposition talk where Hope, the daughter, is like, what does this mean, John? And, or, sorry, not Hope. Let's try that again. Where Virtue, Virtue? the daughter, is like, what does this mean, John? And he goes, it means that even though Agnes is dead, we must study her book for your mother knew the future. Like whatever and then i think really the like yeah. biggest crime against like television and editing really in like this entire episode is that virtue reads out loud prophecy 2214 which is in december 1980 an apple will arise no man can eat invest thy money in master job's machine and good fortune will tend thy days and it doesn't fade midway through to anathema as a child reading it out loud from her copy of the book like that's the obvious move here but instead uh, we complete this entire scene and then go to malibu introduce her introduce her drawing on the book and then like she like reads it out loud after like two more minutes and we already heard it and then they like are like oh by the way here's the joke in case you didn't get the joke like we got the fucking joke the first time well to be fair to them we have already been recording <laughs> for like an hour and ten minutes or whatever so i think they can do whatever they want in terms of not being efficient in their uh, storytelling. It just doesn't make sense. Like, I feel like just, like, day one in, like, TV editing and writing class, you'd be like, <laughs> to show time passing, it's helpful if you plan to have two characters read the exact same thing in different times to just fade midway through the reading. Ugh, <sighs> whatever. This made me so irrationally mad. <laughs> Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think I just have a thing where I hate when TV assumes I'm stupid, but then if I don't get it, I'm like, they should have assumed I was stupid more. <laughs> like, they have to understand yeah. exactly what I get and don't get, and if they don't, then, like, they were bad writers forever and ever. Yeah. Did you not have this thought at all? No, absolutely not. Man, you were just like... Let's just hear this whole prophecy again and then hear her mom well, explain I mean, it. I thought it was fucking corny. Like, uh -huh. okay, we get it. But, like, I was more, like, curious on who plays the mother. I was like, is this the woman who plays the, um, the, like, the mother of Orla from Dairy Girls? Huh, I don't, does she look like that? She looks like her, but it's not her. Uh, right, Aunt Sarah is Orla's mom. Yeah. yeah. I did not yeah. find her to look like anyone in particular, but I guess I can see it. The god narrator mentions that, like, this is the only, like, book in all of human history which was, like, 100% accurate predictions about the next 350 years. Um, and it describes all the events that are going to culminate in Armageddon. So, next we cut to Malibu, California, and it's 11 years ago, the night that Adam was born. We have Anathema as a little girl, and she's being quizzed on the prophecies by her mom. And, you know, they do. she has to read out loud the fucking Apple one again. And then, 
like, to really hammer home the joke, she's like, that doesn't make any sense, Mom! And her mom's like, you might think that, but we bought shares of Apple computers, and... She literally don't think that at all. (laughs) And now, we are very rich and have a very nice house, so... There. Do you get it now, audience? Do you get it? Man. <laughs> um, right. Oh, and we get the next prophecy. I, I find this interesting. Mm-hmm. So I read some of the prophecies. Like, yes. I opened the wiki page and I read through them. Mm-hmm. They're not in order. Are oh, they yeah, they're order? not in chronological order. Uh, I think how she explains it in the book is that, like, these were all sort of, like, these visions weren't, like, visions. They, like, were, like, memories for Agnes. It's like Agnes had the brain of oh, someone who yeah. could see or who lived, like, way far into the future. So, like, she was just, like, remembering things out of order that seemed to pertain to her descendants and writing it down. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yar. Uh, oh, and 2213 is relevant, I suppose. It's four shall ride, and three shall ride the sky as two, and one shall ride in flames, and there shall be no stopping them, not fish, nor rain, neither devil or angel, and ye shall be there also. Anathema. She literally threw us in this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I just... I'm assuming that this book was studied by all generations, so, like, yeah. at what point did, like, Anathema's freak parents go, like, you know, I think it's, it's time, time for the world to end. Let's let's hit our daughter with the name. <sighs> like, yeah. they chose this for her 100%. She didn't have to be a part of this if they just named her, like, fucking Angela. <laughs> yeah, like, what if, like, she had a sister and, like... Like, what if she was, like, part of a twin set? And they were like, okay, one okay, of them which is one? gonna live let's, a completely Okay, let's flip a life. coin, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the other one is going to be the run the world fucking ends. Let's let's flip a coin. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it says that she will there be there, too. But her mother is insistent that she will save the world, which is interesting to me. Yeah, I guess maybe the idea is just, like, well, we're skilled and we, like, know all this shit. Like, why else would you be there? Right, so, you know, Anathema's struggling because of all the family expectations put on her. She doesn't look very happy about this situation. Does this carry over to present-day Anathema? Not that much, but, you know, this scene does happen. Did you know Anathema's supposed to be 19? Is she? Yeah. (laughs) She was was 8 in the first She's supposed to be, yes. Which, man, she had to memorize so much shit at age eight. First of Sorry, all, man. That's not an eight year old. Yeah. I I know eight year olds and that's not one of them. Is she like even in the in the in the show, she's supposed to be nineteen? I don't think they specify, but there's nothing to say that. Maybe she like she's supposed be. to be older in the show. I Perhaps. don't buy it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and her actress is 27 in 2019, so Mm -hmm. very difficult to buy. Next, we're introduced to Newton Pulsifer, who is a descendant of adultery, and... First of all, Mm -hmm. I feel like if your surname is Pulsifer... Yeah. I don't know, I feel like I would oscillate back and forth between it's so Jover and we're so back. Like, that like that could be the best thing that's ever happened to you having the surname Pulsive, or it, or it could be the best, you know? You said best twice, I think, but I think I know what you <laughs> well, mean. Well, apparently I think it's a good thing. Like, it could be the worst thing that's ever happened to you, or it could be the best, yeah. What What are the pros and cons of this last name? Hit me with it. Well, it sounds like Lucifer well, it's Wait, okay. Lucifer, okay, you okay, foremost. so you actually feel that way because in the book and the radio show, like Newt yeah. introduces himself and Shadwell's like, "Oh my god, did you say Lucifer? Get away from me. What the fuck?" And I always thought that was so corny because I was like, "It doesn't even sound like Lucifer." But I guess if you think it that has the L and the S sound and I, the fur. Yeah, like, sure. But yeah. like, I don't know. Words have syllables in them. 
I suppose so. But no, no, it sounds like Lucifer. It sounds vaguely evil. Like, I love it. Vaguely evil yeah. is true. That part's fairly yeah. fun. Uh, so his gimmick is that every time he... He loves computers, but every time he tries to fix one, <laughs> he just just... destroys everything. <laughs> Like, all he does is change the plug on his old home computer, <laughs> he plugs it in, and then the electricity yeah. for the entire street goes out. I thought there was a, this was a pretty funny and effective gag. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, when he was a kid, he just turns off all the lights in the entire street. Mm-hmm. And this apparently has happened so many times into his adulthood that he just has accepted that this is how his life goes. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Like, is there ever, like, an explanation that they give no. as to why this happens? No, it's just <laughs> it's just a fact about him. Yeah, it's <laughs> just Completely unrelated thing. to all of the occult forces in the world. Yeah. God, that's funny as hell. Yeah, I feel like... Is it the same power? The same power. Like, in the book? Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, the same thing. I say thing. power, but, like, the it's same the same curse. thing, yeah. yeah. I don't know, I'm sure there's a joke in there about how, like... It's just because, like, his... Because adultery was so opposed to, like, modernity that, like, it just continued throughout the ages. But also, like, his mom seems fine. Well, I guess it would be his dad. Yeah, maybe his dad, yeah. Because he still keeps the last name. But, yeah. We now cut to adult Newton. First day of his new job as a wages clerk. And I love how... (laughs) I like his mom was, like... Well, you're probably gonna be bad at this. <laughs> it's like, okay, mom. <laughs> yeah. I found that so amusing. I thought that was really funny. Mm-hmm. Like, his mom was like, yeah, I've accepted who you are. <laughs> and who you are is a person who ruins Everything. every job opportunity <laughs> due to your inability to work a computer. Yeah, poor guy. I'm sure there are professions he could go into instead. But yeah, I and mean, his thing is that he just loves computers so much that he keeps trying. So, I mean, this is a pretty brief moment. It's just he goes in, he asks if he can do the job without the computer. They're like, no. And then he tries to log into the computer and he immediately fucks everything and gets fired. Yeah. Uh, and, and also they're announcing like um, an HR thing. A team building exercise yeah. in the in the room while it happens which isn't that relevant but you know it comes up again he gets fired of yep, course he gets super duper fired he names his car which like this is completely irrelevant to anything ever i forgot the surname of the car but uh, like it's he called has dick it written turpin. in the it's called dick turpin. yeah <laughs> yeah anyway like somebody passes him by and goes Hey, Dick. And he's like, oh, no, 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 that's not my name. This is the name of the car. <laughs> and, like, the lady just keeps on walking. He's like, you can you ask, ask me why. why, the, the, why? And, like, she dig off. And <laughs> he, and, like, his box breaks and everything falls to the floor. And it's just like, damn, this guy's fucking unlucky. But also, he is a guy who names his car Dick. And, I, you know, that's a lovely thing. Yeah. Unless so, you're about to say something completely horrendous about this. Not one. about In the name. Case, it's not a lovely thing. Not okay, about the on. name. What I would like you to know is that in the book, the model, this car is a Japanese model. It's called the Wasabi. <laughs> um, okay. It, <laughs> the, what Japanese model? Like, does it just say Japanese model or? I like it. The car. Oh, no, no, no. The, the, the car mm-hmm. model. Is called the Wasabi. Oh, yeah. The car is like, still named Dick Turpin. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> they even try. They even like it's a Toyota Wasabi. It's just a fucking Wasabi. <laughs> no, it's just the Wasabi. So there's that, and then um, they basically say like it's the worst car ever. They say it would be a very accurate historian who could pinpoint the precise day when the Japanese changed from being fiendish automatons who copied everything from the West to becoming skilled and cunning engineers who would leave the West standing. But the wasabi had been designed on that one confused day. Which, honestly, so far, I think is fine. It seems like it's, like, parodying the ways that the West view Japanese innovation and the Japanese government, like, depending on, like, like the economic competition of the time. But then, like, okay, so what we learn 
I think that the name of it being the wasabi is kind of fucking weird. Um, and then we learn that its features are a Korean radio that picks up Radio no. Pyongyang, which is like the, like a North Korean radio thing, which is okay confusing and feels quite like all Asia is the same. And then First of all, has, yeah. the mere fact that you think back in whatever, the 80s, the 90s, uh-huh. that a fucking Japanese manufacturer <laughs> will get a Korean part in their car is insane. <laughs> but okay, go on. Good point. Yeah, uh, and it has a simulated electronic voice which warned you about not wearing a seatbelt even when you were. It had been programmed by someone who not only didn't understand English, but didn't understand Japanese either. And then in the radio show, in 2015, like, they're like, how do we, like, how do we show this through audio, right? (laughs) They're like, how do we show through audio that this is a (laughs) car with a bad English voice? And how they show it is that Newt says... Oh, well, this car like to, likes to say, please put on seatbelt, <laughs> but, like, in an even worse racist action. <laughs> Sorry, accent. In an even worse racist accent. And, like, I don't I think the interesting thing about the radio show is, like, this is your chance to change some things about the book you wrote. Yeah. You're, it's 2015. You're a changed man, <laughs> hopefully. You're like, I need to adapt mm-hmm. this for audio, but also for, like... My my new values in the my world as the audience, yeah. yeah as Neil Gaiman, someone who's aware of the international audience of this book, and also someone who's probably less racist than I was twenty five years ago. <laughs> Let's do this. Crazy, <laughs> crazy. Two more car facts are that um, the book says that the only expert on the wasabi is someone who lives in Nagiri Zushi, Japan. Which is just the word mm. for hand rolled sushi. So that's yeah. just continuing <laughs> on the wasabi joke or whatever, right? And then last what? thing is that it's... the car eventually gets yeah. fixed so that it states all of its instructions in haikus. So these are oh all God. the facts about this car. Did they do examples of the haiku? Yes, let me find one actually. Um. Late frost burns the bloom. Would a fool not let the belt restrain the body? That's actually pretty good. (laughs) Anyway, this would be great if Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett remembered that Japan was a real place with real people in it. And weren't just like, I think it's just funny to think about the two things that we as British people know about Japan and just put it in there. Oh, 2015 radio show, I enjoy you, but that was definitely a moment that you had. But you know what? In in the... Oh, actually, one last thing is that the in the prophecy, there's a prophecy that involves Newt's car, and um, it says, like, when Orient's chariot, blah, 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 and, like, Anathema's like, oh, that must mean it's a Japanese car. Oh! <laughs> That's what I was. I I read that. Like I saw that in the because there was there's a point in this episode where they flash the stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The prophecies on the thing. Yeah. And when I read that, I was like, huh, huh. But the thing is, in okay. the show, they actually okay. First of all, his car isn't a wasabi anymore. It's like some random thing. Yeah. And when they actually read the prophecy out loud in the show, they've changed it to when Robin's blue chariot. So, like, whoever... Oh, yeah, you yeah. mentioned this. Oh, did I? Okay, yeah. I love to complain to everyone about everything, so... So, I think whoever did the overlay is just, like, fucked up because they copy-pasted it from, the from the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I don't know. Everyone point and laugh at the, the accidental revealing of the original racism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, those are all my car facts. Well, my car fact is I googled what Bentley... Crowley was driving, and I got spoiled <laughs> over a pretty mm. big plot point, I think. Wait, so, which one? I, I think I got... I mean, to be, okay, I was gonna say this later, but I actually wrote my predictions, like, 
pretty much immediately after I watched this episode the first time, which was okay, immediately so, after we stopped recording okay, last so week. So they're all pure. So I this the, all my predictions are pure, and we'll get into it later in the show in this podcast. Mm. But I did like put a prediction that kind of has this vibe, and basically I learned that towards the end of this season, I presume the car something happens to the car or other and adam brings it back when he brings everything back to the way they were oh that's a lot of spoilers yeah i mean i literally just googled what car (laughs) crowley good omens and it showed me all these things i was like "Uh (laughs) uh-oh ouch yeah um yeah i think it's um what is it? In the book, it's a 1929 Bentley, but in the show, they use a 1934 model. I think it's a 26 here. Or... Oh, oh, really? Yeah, because they said that the... Is it a 19... Okay, maybe it was a 1926... 1920- Let me see. Why don't you Google it, and I won't do it. You're because... right. It's a 1926, <laughs> yeah. according to this yeah. PDF. I think I read an interview where someone said 1929, and I copied it down wrong there. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, it's a updated model in the show because they said the 1926 one did not have the look they were going for. You know, we get a brief scene of Anathema coming into the UK via an airport and stuff. It's just, like, a corny thing where they ask her purpose of visit and she, like, looks yeah. really intently at the camera and is like, oh, blah, 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 ancient family prophecy, hunt down the dark heart of darkness and destroy it, blah, blah, blah. Which, I mean, there are just certain scenes in this show that were clearly written for the trailer, and this is one of them. Yeah. You always say that. You know what? I looked up a conversation we had a couple months ago <sighs> about a specific scene in this episode. Do you remember it? Which scene is it the get me Later. get thee behind oh the fucking wall slam fuck off yes <laughs> let's get into it when we get to that scene. is it the one where it's i talk about the difference between characters being in real love and when queer baiting comes in and makes it stupid yes <laughs> you know what in that conversation what you say is they obviously put that in there for the trailer like <laughs> Apparently, this is something in your heart that yeah. you have thought about. Some things and are put in you. for the trailer since forever. Yeah. Also, like I got, I, I, I was validated in this because there's an interview about a line in season two where um the actors are like, oh, and when I was reading this, I knew it was a trailer line, so I had to like deliver it really good. <laughs> So, like, this is a thing. I'm right about everything always. Newt is walking out, being super fired, lying to his mom about being super fired. And then he runs into Shadwell, who is a guy with a sign warning about witches. And, like, yelling at everyone and calling them sissies and saying that, like, the biggest threat facing the Earth isn't global warming or nuclear war. It is witches. Uh, and Newt stops to talk to him, and they hang out a bit. Newt, we don't really know his motivations in, like, wanting to be part yeah, of this. I, like, does he would you do this, actually man? believe in witches, or, like, is he just, like... Yeah, I don't... This... Also, like, the guy is, like... He's a misogynist. Steals from him. <laughs> yeah, and he yeah, steals no, I mean, money from him. Like, even if, like, okay, let's say, okay, this guy is a misogynist, blah, blah, blah. Like, I can think of reasons why a young man would be like, yeah. okay. But the moment a guy steals from you, essentially, yeah. money. Forces you to pay for his food and stuff. It's over. It's over. And yeah. we are never going to be back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't know, if this is just like, he's so desperate that he's looking for a new job through here, like, this is not a, a profitable this is not thing. You are losing money. money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I I also don't know what his motivations are. And I given you saying this, I assume it's not expounded on later, which makes me a bit sad. Yeah, it also makes me a bit sad. Is it just is like he, he's a he descendant? Has he become like a real person? Uh, like Newton. Uh, 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, he's just there to be a silly little guy. A lot of these characters are just here to be silly little guys. But I feel like, you know, like, Adam's friends oh, yeah. Adam's seem friends to be real people. Real-ish. Yeah. He passes his interview, which is just, what's your name? Oh, I recognize that last name. How many nipples do you have? The usual two? All right, you're hired. Come here, and he gives him a newspaper. At 11 with scissors. And I feel like the thing about not knowing Newt's motivations is that, like, we're generally supposed to like him, but, like, this feels very incel, or, like, you know, like, the whole, yeah, like, young white man gets radicalized by, like, some extreme right-wing group because he's unemployed or otherwise disillusioned with the world, because, like, I mean, like, the first thing we learned about Shadwell is how much he hates women so bad it's unreal. And, you know, the ad has, like, be a man on it. And in the book, that seems to be, like, what draws Newt in. He doesn't, like, meet him in person. He just sees the ad and he's like, well, I want to be a man. So. Huh. But, like, none of that really seems to carry over to, like, anything he does or says very much either. So... Who knows what's up with this guy? Anathema's moving in to Jasmine Cottage in Tadfield. What I don't get. Her family has known about this for 350 years, and she's like, I'm gonna go find who the Antichrist is two days before it's time. (laughs) I'm flying to the UK two days before the end of the world. Like, do they not give a shit? They don't gaff. They don't gaff. Like, in the book, she's, like, there for a lo- a way longer time beforehand. And I get that, like, it's TV. We want, like, a tight schedule. We want each episode to be sort of, like, a day or whatever. We want the countdown. But, like, couldn't she have just already been there still? I mean, they were already doing flashbacks. You can just yeah, do Yeah, a flashback of flashbacks. her moving in a while ago. ADHD queen. So now we finally go back to Crowley and to the plants scene. They're on their throne and they're not having fun because they're like, man, how the fuck did I fuck this up? This sucks so bad. And then we meet their plants in her plant room and they're beautiful and green, but Basically, we learned that how she maintains them is that she learned about talking to plants in the 1980s as a thing, but, like, totally misunderstood the purposes of that (laughs) as, like, an emotional (laughs) benefit thing. So instead, her thing is, like, she sees a plant with a spot, and she goes, like, is that a spot? Like... You know how I feel about leaf spots. Okay, everyone gather around, see what happens when you disobey me. And then... And I love that this plant starts shaking. Yeah, they literally start shaking. I think that is a very fun visual. She, like, goes out and is like, this is going to hurt you so much more than it will hurt me. And then... Like, you guys fucking grow better! And then, basically, um, we hear the sound of a, of a garbage disposal, and then he comes back in with an empty plant pot and, like, waves it menacingly at the rest. I mean, I think it's an incredibly funny bit, regardless of how in it's character funny, it is. But I do not think it's a significantly in character. I I do think it's funny as hell, though. Okay, the meta that I've read, which I don't really know how much I subscribe to this, is like, okay, so the god narrator is like, he puts the fear of god into them, more precisely, the fear of Crowley. So that coupled with sort of like 
the shitty parent language in like what he's doing here has made some people view this as sort of like him working through like his emotions regarding the fall. Like, well, there was a shitty parent who hated that I asked questions and wasn't perfect, and then she cast me down or whatever, so maybe it'll just help me with stress relief if I do that to these plants. (laughs) Love that. Which is, yeah, I can definitely see how that could be the case. However, I'd say, book fact-wise, the only time that the plants are explicitly connected to anything in Crowley's larger life are when she's thinking about the way that Hell treats her. Um, and it's like they mm-hmm. talk to you like you're a plant that just started growing spots or whatever. So, like, it could be that also, just like a, well, I have a really shitty boss, and this is my way of also being a really shitty boss in order to mm-hmm. feel better. Which, I mean, I guess makes sense. They're plants. Like, I feel like interpretations of Crowley that, like, completely eradicate the fact that, like, they do do bad things and they do enjoy that, like, sometimes when they put, when they, like, fuck up all the phone lines, there is, like, gonna be a new layer of sin on all these people's, like, lives or whatever. So, like... It's not very nicies, but, like, Crowley isn't very nicies either. Crowley's just medium nicies. And they're plants. Like, (laughs) if they were, like, goldfish or some shit, like, this would be a lot darker, but, like, they're plants. And I feel like this tracks with, like, just finding, like, something that you can hurt that won't hurt the world too much. That much. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. I get that. Yeah. Is it still out of character to you? What parts? I think so. Yeah. What parts? I think bother the screaming. You? I yeah. I don't know. You know, my life has sort of been forever changed. That time when Jeb was like, I find it difficult to watch David Tennant act because I know that the whole time he's thinking, "How can I make it more camp?" <laughs> <laughs> it's made watching I... his stuff a lot harder, and I think that that comes out in a lot of the the screaming and the growling and the things. Yeah, like. I think this is solemnly the first time we see him scream in this way because, like, he goes, shit, shit, shit. Yeah, and or he whatever. yells but eternity it's when always like drunk in the bookshop. Yeah, but it's a different vibe. And, like, whenever he gets moderately pissed or whatever with Azuraphale or the plan or what or whatnot, he reacts more often, like, he, like, raises his voice, talks faster, you know, like, he expresses it verbally. Mm. But never to this extent. Yeah. So, I mean, I, whether it's in character or not, I guess it's more of a, well, how does the character pan out? Mm-hmm. You know, like, maybe maybe it's not in character to me right now because all I've seen is previous characterizations, but, like future ones it actually makes more sense but right now like it 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 was like a surprising scene and when i watched it both times that i watched it i did think "Eh." (laughs) Eh." yeah yeah i think that yeah i mean like they're doing a bit like to intimidate the plants but it is odd that, like, that is something that they would feel the need to do in the first place. Like, they're not actually mad. Yeah. Or, I think it would be more fun if they were actually mad. <laughs> like, I think, like, that kind of emotional investment <laughs> to the plants is much, much more fascinating to me. Yeah. I think, also, like, a lot of people theorize that he doesn't actually destroy the plants. Gaff. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need to say I need to stop saying he the gap at every oh, opportunity. Like, okay, he comes back with a pot, and it is the right pot, mm-hmm. but it's also like not yeah, but it's, wet. It feels like he just threw it out. Yeah, it's like right. It's not like like it seems like it's a completely new pot because there's no like bits of dirt clinging to it at all, and like it's not wet, so it's not like he washed it out, and it was also very fast. 
So I think the some yeah. people theorize that he just has like a collection of empty pots that he brings out menacingly, and then he actually that's so fun. He actually keeps so the fun. old plants and either gives them away or like nurses them back to health, and then introduces them into there again as like, look at this new plant I bought to replace that loser. I love that. Yeah, which is very fun. But also, I don't know, maybe he does just shred the plants. Whatever. Maybe he do gaff. <laughs> maybe he do gaff. Aziraphale's in his book. Oh, we see Aziraphale again. Yeah, yeah, your favorite little guy. I don't know. He's having, oh, like, I just know Michael Sheen is having so much fun. Aziraphale's on the phone with his gay little voice and his gay little everything. Yeah. <laughs> God. And, like, someone is inquiring about the book. The Agnes Nutter book, mm-hmm. and like he, we only hear one side of the conversation, uh-huh. and it's like, oh, I don't have the book, and like, oh, there's no price because I really don't have it, and then like we are to assume that the other line like curses him out, yeah. and he goes, well, there's no need to use that kind of language. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I love it so it's much. It's really fun, and, like, and he's like bitchier yeah. than like I feel like the way you put it, like it's very like. I told you, I don't have it. Nobody has it. <laughs> like, yeah, and he, he like, like he looks genuinely offended. Yeah, he's when like, oh. like, he was like, don't, there's no need to use that language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kissing him forever and ever. I love it. Yeah. Um. We come- I need to stop saying that. I mean, you ridiculous. have started making me say it. Have you noticed? <laughs> Just say I love everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I feel like I've sent you the sentence "I love Anthony J. Crowley" multiple times already. This is true. So, Newt goes to the address in Shadwell's advert. And meets Madam Tracy, who is both a medium and a sex worker. Um, and I Is she gonna be relevant? She comes back. Okay. Right. Her thing is just that like she's like an older woman, so she like can't do all the things she used to, but like she's still doing her best with her job or whatever. And like Yeah. I'm fine with her until Shadwell calls her a bunch of names, and she's like, oh. And then also, like, and also that she, like, brings Shadwell tea all the time. Like, I don't know. It's weird. It's very, like, I mean, yeah, I get, like, Shadwell is a kind of man who wouldn't learn how to cook, even though he doesn't have anyone who can do it for him, but I don't know. It's just, it's just annoying. The, the dynamic that is here. And, like, I mean, we're supposed yeah. to think that it's, like, not great, but also, like... Yeah. Ugh. You know. Something I thought of when the scene was happening was, I think even more so than in any other place anywhere that I know of, like, that is prominent in media, mm. the way accents play out in British media is so, like, significant Uh and so, like, easy to spot and easy to, like, kind of figure out. Uh Because, I mean, in the United States, people have different accents in different localities. Yeah. But, I don't know, I can't think of a particular media where I am able to figure out what they're trying to do based on like, which accent people are speaking in. Mm. And I just, like, you know, like, in the UK, the locality, different localities, the classes of people, blah, 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 have different accents. And, like, hearing the difference between Newton and um, the Madam Tracy's accent, I was like, huh, it's different. The accent is different. And, like, I cannot, for the love of God, tell you how they're different or what that means. But, like, the fact that they're different, like, I am able to be, like, oh, they come from, like, they're trying to, like, n- communicate to us that this is, or, like, people from different places or different backgrounds or whatever. And, like, I don't know. I find that fascinating. Yeah. So, he meets Madam Tracy, and there's just, like, a whole joke section where, like, 
She asks him what he's here for. First she thinks that he's here for her medium thing, and then she thinks that he's here for her sex work thing. And he's like, huh, what? No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and then eventually she's like, oh, wait, you're here for Mr. Shadwell. Yeah, okay, go over there. And, you know, Shadwell opens the door. He calls her a harlot, a harlot, a scarlet woman, and a Jezebel. And she's like, oh. (laughs) And then says that she's going to bring them both tea. Book fact is that, like... I feel like I found this less irritating in the book because she, like, her specific reasoning there is like, oh, I mean, I think it's fun when he does that because it's, like, free advertising for my business because he yells so loud, which I think is funny. (laughs) No, I love that. I love that. And this one, she's just like, oh, which, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's also fine if that turns you on, but, like. Yeah, it's just a little... It's just... It is excusing whorephobia by being like, well, she's into it. We got introduced a bit more to the Witchfinder army, which is what Shadwell is sergeant of, and which Newt is joining as a private. And they used to be, like, very powerful, and they come from the original witch hunters, including Adultery Pulsifer. We get a, a Chekhov's gun situation, or... Huh. There's a where there's a gun on the wall, a big old big old gun called the Thunder Gun of Witchfinder Colonel. Get 'em before they get you, Dalrymple. I didn't even think that this would be a Chekhov's gun situation. Oh, whoops! I just ass- I suppose it is. Yeah, I mean now, it is a gun point. hanging on the wall or whatever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I. Mean- <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. And then he says that their main thing is that they read newspapers to check the, like, for weird happenings, and then they cut them out with scissors. But before he explains that, Newt just assumes that they use the scissors to stab witches to death, and he came. Like, he wanted to do that? That was a thing he desired to do? What an when odd said guy. And he came. I was so confused. <laughs> he, he came to Shadwell's place. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't, I don't remember that from the episode. Ah, uh. uh, Crowley gets a call from Aziraphale. Which I think is nice because before Hell called in on her, like, she was, like, considering calling Aziraphale, it seems like, because, like, they were, like, hovering over the phone for a bit first. Crowley's like, no updates, and Aziraphale's idea is that maybe the baby swap went wrong, and there was, like, a third baby somewhere, so, like, let's go check that out. And we see the Bentley driving down the road... Love that. Just it it like opens the the door opens in a different way. I find that so fascinating. It's dodging traffic. It is tire squealing. Crowley is a terrible driver. Um and yeah. they have and the entire time yeah. Azura feels like, can you not do that? <laughs> I'm so scared. <laughs> My tummy hurts and I'm not being brave about it. And he like at some point like Goes, okay, let, well, I mean, maybe we should listen to music. And then he brings out a bunch of CDs. Mm. And one of them is The Velvet Underground. Yep. And he asks, like, what's The Velvet Underground? And Crowley goes, I you don't wouldn't think you like, like them. It. And Azirko goes, ah, Bebop. Why does he not like Bebop? I don't know. I feel like he's Bebop like... is like a kind of jazz, right? What Aziraphale doesn't like interests me so right. much. Right, Sound of Music, yeah. Bebop is a jazz Sound style. of Music, Bebop. Yeah, but he likes Sondheim, and he likes classical music. Maybe maybe we'll get more into it when we find out other things that Aziraphale doesn't like. Yeah, a uh, book fact is that Crowley has a collection of soul music that he has organized alphabetically. Or does organize alphabetically whenever he's stressed. And also he calls it a collection of real soul music. Um, 
Because it doesn't include anything from, I think it was James Brown. And I still don't know what that means. Like, I asked my music major friend, and her best guess was that, like, Crowley might, like, older soul music because James Brown was doing funk in later decades and Crowley might be like uh it was like I liked the old style I liked it better like in his earlier albums sort of thing so he would be more of like an Etta James fan but I I don't know if anyone knows things about music please please chip in because I do feel like if he's gonna be portrayed as white him having a real soul music collection that excludes one of the founding fathers of soul who's a black man does feel very la la land of him so would love insights <laughs> yeah but they also have some really fun conversation on the car where Azarafel's like you've lost the boy and Crowley's like we've lost and Crowley's like and, and Azarafel's like a child has been lost <laughs> I love him so much like, we talked a lot last episode about how Crowley likes to, like, deflect responsibility. Aziraphale's just as bad. Like, neither of them want to be to blame for anything, ever. Literally, a child has been lost. Yeah, yeah. God bless. Oh, also, like, Aziraphale's like, I hope nothing's happened to him. And Crowley's like, well, nothing happens to him, he happens to everything else. But also, like, wouldn't we like it if something happened to him? Wasn't that the vibe of last season? <laughs> or last episode? <laughs> wouldn't it be very convenient if something happened to him? But alas. Oh, right. And then I guess the other thing that we learned is that they don't actually die. They get inconveniently discorporated. Yeah. Meaning that they, like, lose their bodies and have to, like, get a new one. But their spirits Sad. remain. And I guess in this universe, there's no way to kill angels. I love how I say in this universe. <laughs> like, am I, like, implying that in the real la- world, like, in our universe, there is a way to kill angels? Of course, in fact, I am talking about how in the supernatural universe, <laughs> you can kill angels. But that's by the by. Oh, uh, we'll learn more later. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. They're just... They're just being very cute. There's not too much to point out. I just think that they're very married and I love them very much. You know, I never actually did a check-in with you last episode on, like... Like, I know it's, like, a given that, like, that like these two are in love and in a relationship. But, like, where are, where do you stand on on how you how you see these two so far? I don't think I can form any concrete opinions yet yeah other than i think their dynamic is very 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 fun yeah like i like that it's very like um stickler guy who's like um like very like i have no idea how to say anything like very like not he doesn't follow the rules but he's like very like prim and proper Mm -hmm. and like and then like a guy who's like very like yeah whatever who who (laughs) gas Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and like the dynamic is like a very, it's very much one of those like, you know how like people on Twitter are like, oh my god, I love this dynamic so much, and it's like a drawing, and it's a very generic trope. Uh-huh. <laughs> like that's what they <laughs> feel like, but they also feel individually like real people. Yeah, and that's what brings it to life, really. In terms of like, at what. Um, situation is their relationship in right now I think it's very obvious that they are each other's most trusted person Mm -hmm. they like I guess because of the fact that they are both stationed on earth pretty much like adjacent to each other like the role of the other is the role of the other but like in hell and in heaven like you know Mm -hmm. like they are equals they have equal footing in terms of roles and because of that they are really the only two people who understand each other yeah. in this way and I think that's that's a very interesting premise for a relationship yeah I find it fascinating that both of them are situated as they're different from the other people of their 
um, community. Yeah. Like, Aziraphale is different from the other angels. Crowley is different from the other demons. And what they are more most like is each other. Mm-hmm. Even though they are quote-unquote fundamentally different. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I also like that. Very nicely put. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And also they Am want I doing to suck each job? other sloppy <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, a good job. <laughs> um, I feel like honestly, this excursion is less about finding out what I think about good omens and more of finding out if I think the same way you I, think. About I think good it's omens. fine if you think a different way. In fact, I would <laughs> okay. I would appreciate if you did so that we got more diversity of viewpoints here. Because no, but this is genuinely what I no, think, I yeah. no, I mean, I, 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 I do know that. Yeah, thank you for sharing your yeah. thoughts with the class. <laughs> I don't know how to host a podcast. Everyone, take me away. Anyway, uh. um, and they decide that they're gonna go to the convent where the babies were born, see if there are any hospital records, so they can find the boy. And then we we get introduced we, properly we to Adam's friends. friends. Okay, great. You are the only person I know who has contact with a child under the age of 16 regularly in your life. Okay. Yes. These kids. Yeah. Realistic? Well, my, my sister is um, 7 turning 8. So oh, only off by like year three olds. years. This is not too much, is it? Those are it, they're pretty big years when you're as young as that. I feel okay. Like you wouldn't say a four year old is like a seven year old. I guess. you wouldn't say a seven year old is like an eleven year old. Yeah. Okay. So so no no insights from Kid Master General. I think I think I mean I remember being a kid. Oh, I don't. I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, I think this is, like, pretty, um, like, in terms of, okay, something that I really, really like about this friend group, and I don't know if I've said this specific sentiment to you, but I've definitely said it in a public platform. I think if you want to make a friend group feel as believable as possible, Mm. you have got to have one guy in there, and, like, it could also be a girl... But most of the time, it really is a guy who only goes by their surname. So when they go, oh, Wensleydale is never, it's not like Wensleydale is his surname, but nobody calls him that, not even his parents who call him youngster. Yeah. I think that is such an accurate portrayal of what it feels like to have friends, like a friend group. Like Uh you just have a guy there who goes by their surname. (laughs) Yeah. Do you not? Do you not have this I experience? I do not have this experience. I don't think I know anyone who goes by their surname. Every single class I've been in since fifth grade, every single friend group I've been since seventh grade, Damn. we have one guy who only goes by his surname. I Personal actually tried to guy. do this for a while. Uh-huh. I was like, maybe you should. You guys should just call me by my surname. But my surname is quite long. So people would just call me the first syllable of my surname. Yeah, it's probably a region specific thing cuz like the yeah. the Brits have their what their their fancy schools where everyone goes by their last name or whatever. And I guess like in China there's like not that many last names around, so it doesn't make sense. In what? Oh, like there oh, yeah, there's yeah, like yeah, yeah. I get what you mean. Yeah, there's like what is it? there's like a list of like a few hundred that are like the most common and then like basically no one goes off the list so i guess it is less it makes less sense to do that but that is cool so okay we meet the friend group it's adam as the leader and then we've got pepper wensleydale and brian they're all like walking out of an ice cream shop uh i think adam has vanilla which feels very correct for like the human antichrist who's just a regular guy most of the time. Uh, but yeah, we just get a, a bit about their personalities and backstories. Um, Pepper's yeah. thing is that her mom, like, joined, like, a hippie commune, but then, like, it sucked so much that she came back home, joined a sociology 
program to get like a master's degree and shit. Wensleydale's Wensley thing Dale. is that yeah he his name his first name is Jeremy but no one calls him that, and he's just sort of a bit of like a know it all well actually kind of yeah. guy. Which, you know... Yeah, I love the last line in his thing where it's like, the only thing separating Wensleydale from... Chartered um, accountancy. Chartered accountancy. Is time. Is time. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Very fun. And then Brian's thing is just that he's a nice boy who's always dirty and supports Adam yeah. in everything he does. This is a very accurate portrayal of what it's like to be an 11-year-old, I feel. Mm. There's just a guy who's just always nasty and dirty. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Remember in Supernatural when Dean was like, I need to figure out if Jack is evil or not, so he offers him an angel food cake and then (laughs) a double food cake. 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 Yeah. That's what Adam getting vanilla feels like to me. No, for fucking real. They were like, is he gonna choose the light <laughs> or the, or the dark. darkness? And they made him eat the vanilla ice cream. Yeah. God, they should do that joke in Good Omens. They really should. They really fucking should. I, they should have um, a zero fail be revealed as being such a big fan of Devil's Food Cake and they'll have like a little aside about it of like, haha, that's so funny. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I like... I like the denser cake more than the fluffy one. <laughs> I feel like there's, like, this happens in, like, multiple fix that I've read. Oh, yeah, that's got to. Yeah. It has got to. Right. Also, like, Adam's dad let him keep the dog, and the dog's on a leash with him, looks very happy. The two of them are vibing real hard. Yeah. Good for them. Not only it is it the dog, it is also dog. Yeah. I love that. So, later, Anathema's trying- Oh, well, I guess, what, Adam says something slightly ominous about how nobody's gonna take Dog away from me. We're together to the end. (laughs) Normal things to say. Later, Anathema's, you know, trying out some of her her witch instruments to track down the Antichrist. It's not working. Um, And the kids are hanging out in the woods, talking about how a witch recently moved in. I don't know, they're just being, like, charming children saying things that are supposed to be funny because of their limited view of the world or whatever. Like, they talk about witch burnings, and Adam's like, well, I don't think it's allowed to set fire to people, or else, like, everyone would be doing it all the time. And then, like, Brian is like, okay, but, like, it was for the witch's own good because it saves them from going to hell, so they'd probably be really grateful if they knew. Yeah, and he was like... I think it's fine. They did it in Spain. It's Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> yeah, so they decide that they want to play the they Spanish Inquisition. They want to become Inquisition. the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> uh-huh. Jesus Christ. This, I feel like this I love is it. how kids work. This is true. I know. I do love it. I genuinely it's, think it's, it's so funny. It's a fun time. They're all, they're all very charming and British and young. <laughs> Yeah. I think the only games I played with my friends when I was 11 were, like, like Pac-Man on the blacktop. Like, it was, like, sort of, like, t- freeze tag, but not. Yeah. But, yeah. We cut to the car again, because they've gotten to the Tadfield area. Crowley drops that there's an airbase nearby, um, because that was the whole plan with the- with Harriet Dowling- um, having to land here in an emergency and then give birth and blah blah blah. She's kind of upset that it didn't work out because it was pretty well organized. Aziraphale has... Yeah, I love that. A, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful moment where he goes, Ah, but evil always contains the seeds of its own destruction, no matter how well planned... How foolproof an evil plan, no matter how apparently successful it may seem upon the way, in the end it will founder on the rocks of iniquity and vanish. (laughs) And Crowley goes, for my money, it was just an ordinary cock-up. Oh, they're just so fun to watch. Like, I don't even have anything to say. It's just like, I love reliving how they're like silly little guys. 
They really are. They're so cute. God, you know what I feel so strongly about what? right now? I hope to God they do a season three. <laughs> like, I know you think season two is bad. <laughs> yeah. But, like, I need... I need as much of this as I possibly can. We'll see how you feel after we watch season two. I mean, I, like, obviously do... The thing is, Neil Gaiman has... He says he's promised, I say he's threatened, to write a novel if season three doesn't happen. And I I don't want to read that. So, yeah, please renew it so that... I can watch Michael Sheen and David Tennant do it instead of having to see Neil Gaiman try to write solo, like, without any of the their silly little voices helping me. So yeah, I mean, I want season three because I would like a resolution to the season two ending, but I, I do feel distrustful of what the quality of that season three is going to be. Remember when... I think a couple of weeks ago you were like, Gray, can you please just watch Good Omens? Like, I just need someone to talk to about it. And I said yes, and then a couple hours later, I was like, hey, so my vacation ended, and I thought about this a little bit more, and I think I don't want to be a person who has watched Good Omens. Yeah. Well, what do you say to that past Gray now, huh, Gray? It's not an information that I would volunteer to other people. Still? I would say that. Yeah, I feel like there's a certain connotation to a good omens watcher. Wait, wait, you know? tell me tell me more about this. It has the same vibe as a supernatural watcher. It I I would mostly compare it to being a supernatural watcher. I'd say in some crowds a watcher? N- no what? No, god, no, no, no. It's I think <laughs> in, in some crowds it's considered worse than being a supernatural watcher because I feel like with supernatural it's like, oh, I just got caught up in like the moment of the times, but, like, I don't anymore. It's just something that happened, yeah. Um, whereas Good Omens feels like more of a deliberate choice, but I would say that quality-wise, like, clearly one of them is better. Oh, clearly. So, it's very clear, yeah. I feel like if you're talking to someone who's seen a bit of both, it's better to be a Good Omens watcher than a Supernatural watcher. But yeah, okay, so you don't volunteer that you've seen Supernatural to people either. If you've been around me long enough, you'll just know. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. I mean, every week I have to go, oh, I can't go to that Because I have I to have podcast to. about <laughs> Supernatural. <laughs> yeah. No. This is yeah. true. So, Anathema runs into the kids playing the, the British Inquisition. Adam's the leader, Wensley Dale is the witch, Pepper is chief inquisitor, and Brian is head torturer. Uh, Anathema's a little alarmed by this whole game, and is just trying to figure out if there are any great beasts about that could signify that the the Antichrist is near. The game itself is just like, you know, are you a witch? No, you have to say no so we can torture you. And then the torture is just pushing him around on a tire swing. Fun times. Uh, I think a, an interesting Adam moment is when, like, he's talking to Anathema about the great beasts, and then he pauses her halfway through and goes, wait, I have to tell them what to do, and then directs the next part of the game. So, yeah, I mean, I think they're doing a decent job at establishing Adam's, like, leadership and things and like how he has qualities that could definitely be turned to evil if he chooses to eat the devil's food cake back to the the convent god they have they must have the craziest craziest sex Zeriel Crowley get out to the convent which has changed a lot and Zeriel talks about how this place feels loved which is the opposite of when you say, I don't like this place, it feels spooky. Crowley says, I don't ever say that. I like spooky. Big spooky fan me. Which is a is a favorite Crowley sentence to me just because I feel like it really highlights his sentence construction and the way it differs from my own. Yeah. So they both get shot with paintballs. Oh, I want to say mm-hmm. that I find the whole, like... Oh, it feels love. And, like, later on, yeah. 
while they're in the car driving through Tadsfield yeah. or Tadfield, he also goes like, "There's like flashes of love in mm-hmm. here," and. I like put this in my predictions, but all I said was like, I'm curious about this. Okay. <laughs> I didn't predict anything. I was like, huh, this is interesting. So I yeah, okay, yes or no question. Is that going to be relevant? Is that gonna play out in any way major? It's I'd say that the show doesn't just does, doesn't do a great job at explaining what it is, but it is somewhat plot relevant. Something. Okay. Well, I find it interesting, and like, I assume it's the, well, actually, I don't know what to assume, but interesting thing. Because Zerophil stops him before they get in, and he puts his arm out to stop him before he talks about how he feels like there is love here, and anyway, they make it crazy. So they get a paintball shot um, by some guy, and Crowley turns their face into like a big old snake monster with tusks to make the guy pass out. Like mm-hmm. I when it happened, I was also so shocked because I did not expect it at all. Yeah. And I just burst out laughing immediately after as the guy collapsed to the ground. Very funny. I was like, hell yes. This is such funny. Like, oh he said demon antics. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a good moment of like, oh yeah, um they can really look however they want, whenever. Like, everything about their form is sort of a choice. And book fact is that the way that this is written out is where one of the figures had been, there was something dreadful. He blacked out. Crowley restored himself to his favorite shape. I hate having to do that, he murmured. I'm always afraid I'll forget how to change back. And it can ruin a good suit. I think the maggots were a bit over the top myself, said Aziraphale. (laughs) Okay, but I just... I love that Crowley That's has so lovely. a favorite shape and that he's worried that he can't yeah. change that. Like, it's so fucking transgender to me. It literally is. Like, yeah, like, he I chooses to look like this all the time because, like, that is, like, that's, like, yeah, that's his favorite shape. Like, he thinks that he, like, should look like a human who's, like, skinny and tall and tries to be cool. Like, that's him. Oh, I love him. I love him a lot. I mean, if you can choose your form, would you not choose to look like David Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It's not a feeling form. Yeah, I mean, I do I do want his gender really, really bad. I spent a lot of 2019 elaborating in multiple group chats how I want to put him in a blender and then drink him like a smoothie so that I can get his gender. Uh. So, yeah... I mean, I get it, but I don't want to be white. That's that's the difficult part. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta figure it out. Also, I feel like in this scene, it's very clear how you can see Crowley's chest hair through his v-neck, so that's just, like, a fact for the people out there who may care about such things. Okay, they then... T- <sighs> Crowley and Zerfield go through a little dance here, which I think, like, really signifies how they're going to have the craziest sex in a few years. Um, where, you know, Xerophil's like, oh, like, look at this coat. Like, I've kept it so nice for 180 years, and now I'll never get the stain out. And Crowley's like, okay, well, you can miracle it away. And, like, Xerophil starts, like, literally, like, turning his body to, like, sort of, like, force the stain in Crowley's face. And Crowley, like, follows him in doing it. Like, they're both like, doing whatever this is. And he's like, oh, but, you know, I would always know it was there underneath. And then Crowley's like, okay, fine. And then he miracles it away by, like, blowing gently at Aziraphale's back and, like, the paint sort of, like, goes off. And it's like, first off, that is not different from what Aziraphale could have (laughs) done. Like, yeah. This is not the only thing you gained here was like getting like your acts of service not boyfriend to like acts of service you. <laughs> like, 
the, 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 there's no point to this besides just like, oh, well, I mean, I just like sort of making you do nice things for me because, like, it makes me feel all tingly inside. Like, what are they doing? What's happening? They are, they're fucking so hard. Anyway. I was here going to bring up the whole how they do miracles yes. in a uh, Good Omens so far. So, like, for this scene, and for something I was brought up last episode, which is that Azurafil likes doing physical human magic, like, illusions and stuff, because he, like, that's, like, more fun than doing the the magic that he actually can mm-hmm. do. And then later in that episode, he revives a dove who like gets crushed in his even jacket though in the book something. Crowley was the one who did it yes continue oh really oh yeah well anyway I wanted to say last episode but I didn't get to that I really like the way he revives the bird which is he taps on its chest the way Catholics do when we pray the mia culpa oh like the um through my fault through my fault through my most grievous fault uh prayer he does it to the bird, and then the bird comes to life. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, th- I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. And so here, we kind of get like a resurgence of that, where like he doesn't want to do his own magic, because he knows how it works. Mm. But like he's not opposed to Crowley doing it for him, yeah. because maybe like Crowley's magic works a different way. Maybe. And it's more, like, it's, like, unfathomable to him, so it's not as clear-cut in his mind how it actually works. Yeah. That is so fascinating. They do have a different source. I think there are scenes where they're miracling and, like, Aziraphil makes a gesture that makes it seem like he's drawing the power down from heaven and Crowley, like, draws the power up from the ground from hell. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I find that interesting where it's like he likes it more when he, the thing feels when he doesn't know how it works. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I also just find like later on we get more miracles where he commands light to appear mm-hmm. and he builds a bicycle raft. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he fixes up bones and stuff. Mm. I think that is interesting in the he does do it. Like, he did it with the bird. He did it with the hit and run, not run situation. Yeah. So, like, he can do it. He just doesn't want to if it's not completely necessary and the only choice. Yeah, that makes sense. I do sincerely wonder if that comes up later on. <laughs> or, like, is it as recurring as it has been this past two episodes? Yeah. 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 The way his relationship with magic, as we say, or, you know, his powers work is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess it's less miraculous when you know how it works. Yeah. Right. And that does sort of contrast with, at least in, at least Book Crowley, like, it talks about how he has, like, a computer and a TV and all those things, and none of them are ever plugged in because he just assumes that they would work because he's like seen tvs around and they work (laughs) so like he doesn't even bother thinking about how they work so yeah i feel like crowley does like a lot of unconscious magic because he's just like well this is how the world is right and then it just happens like that whereas xerophil owns a computer and uses it like perfectly like normally like he was one of the first people to buy computers when they got invented and he does his taxes on them like with it like plugged in and all set up i would assume so yeah aziraville does have like more of a penchant for doing things the human way and only like miracling in Mm -hmm. specific circumstances and the magic's not really there yeah i agree nice they they have a bit of a talk about guns because of the paintball gun and Crowley thinks Heaven's, like, generally anti-gun, but Azira feels like, well, unless they're in the right hands, then they give weight to a moral argument. I think. <laughs> He's and not Crowley's sure. 
so <laughs> amused at this. Like, you know, they're laughing it up, going, a moral argument, really. And then... I mean, if somebody says this uh-huh. to me, literally anyone says this to me, I would have the exact same reaction at the yeah. And, and if like, I had oh, the power to okay. win an argument by turning all the guns real... I would do exactly... <laughs> Yeah, I would do exactly what Crowley does as well. Yeah, God. So basically, the the previous the convent has now been transformed into a jobs training place, where companies take people and they like team build by doing paintball and all that shit. Um, but it's owned by Sister Mary Loquacious, who was a former nun here. I don't know. We get scenes of like. All the people out there, like, shooting at each other. And Crowley just, like, tells one of them, Hey, you're all gonna lose. And then snaps his fingers and all the guns turn into real machine guns. And, you know, Aziraphale's like, what the fuck? And Crowley's just like, hey, well, that's what they wanted. Because they hate each other so much. So I just gave them what they wanted. Um... And also, it lends weight to their moral argument. (laughs) Everyone has free will, including the right to murder. So real. So, I don't know, we get, like, suspense building up, like, oh my god, are people actually gonna die? And Azira feels like, oh my god, they're all murdering each other? And Azira, and Crowley's like, no, they aren't. No one's killing anyone. They're all just, like, miraculously escaping. And then ugh, we got fucking wall slam scene. It's yeah. so annoying. Did you? Okay, I know where you complained to you about it. So did you find it jarring at all? Or like, do you think my, my perspective colored your ability to view it as a first viewer? Well, I mean, I didn't expect it to be here first and foremost. Mm. So when it first happened, I was like, Oh, this is happening, and then oh, this is the scene that Crystal is like, oh, this <laughs> queer bit, whatever. <laughs> and I think I do agree in a way that like he he don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> they don't need to do that. Okay, for context, one day I was on. Twitter. Oh, this was way before season two, before people are like, how is it queer bait if they actually kiss? Continue. It's like in June, I think. Like, it's way back. Mm -hmm. And somebody tweeted that like, oh my god, um, you can see that like, when Crowley slams Aziraphale against the wall, like, it's so gentle, like, (laughs) Aziraphale's head (laughs) doesn't He even hit the wall. And it's like, he's not even trying to hurt him at all. He's just, they're just play fighting. And it's so cute. <sighs> and I tell, I tell Crystal, oh, they're, they're posting um, Good Omens GIFs on my Twitter feed. I don't follow any of these people, by the way. This is the For You page <laughs> of Twitter. And Crystal is like, okay, let me see. And then I <laughs> send the tweet. And they go... Oh, this like like that's not even like oh they love each other so much and that's why this this scene is played out this way and, like he literally just fucking slams it in the wall like that because they're actors and David Tennant is trying to not hurt my machine <laughs> and I was like okay and then they proceed to <laughs> send like messages about how like you know there's a difference between scenes that are actually gay and like only gay for the trailer and to like queer bit and like they like gave me examples of how this is present in other media oh god what were my <laughs> fucking was, examples it was a very fascinating day what were, what were my examples i mean the examples you gave were like um in house md like the proposal Thing was like oh that's queer bit whatever but like the actual like relationship isn't or like in um supernatural the oh the the guy the angel in the trench coat who's in love with you is queer bait but like them staring into each other's <laughs> eyes while Cass confesses that he doesn't know what's right and wrong is actually gay you know yeah and here 
like slamming against the wall is like f- gay for the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> But gay for pay. Like there are other scenes that are actually gay. You know what? I stand by that mostly. It's about like the lines that no, are. No, I do. I do completely. Yeah, get what it's you like mean. yeah. Oh, we're aware of what the fans are thinking, so let's play into that a bit to like be funny and to make them think that maybe we're gonna do it. But I mean, I I guess they do kiss in season two. I just every time you watch season one, I just need you to remember. That I thought that this was like that they weren't ever gonna do a sequel, and this was all that I was gonna get, and that they were never, ever, ever going to admit that they were romantically interested in each other. It really is a different experience in this new world. But yeah, so basically, like Azira feels like, oh, you know, Crowley, I've already, I've always said that deep down, you're really quite a nice. And then Crowley grabs him by the lapel, slams him into the wall. And goes like, shut it, I'm a demon, I'm not nice, I'm never nice. Nice is a four-letter word, but like, genuinely angry. And it's like, <sighs> no he's not. <laughs> I don't, I just don't know what the motivation here is. I don't get it. It's, I just feel like this is not something he would have, like, genuine insecurities about. Maybe it's like a, it would be dangerous to say something like that out loud. If Hell's Watching, but, like, it doesn't feel like that either. It just feels like an excuse for the wall slam. And, you know, book <laughs> fact, yeah. when Azir, or when Aziraphale tells Crowley you this- Yes, I know I here. did. <laughs> the only response is, it, it goes, all right, all right, Crowley snapped. Tell the whole blessed world, why don't you? Like- you know, that's like a normal response. Like, okay, ha ha, laugh it up. Yeah, sure, I'm being nice. Whatever. Let's not think about it too hard. Like, that makes sense. Cool. You guys are cute. Keep going. I mean, that is significantly more like, ha, huh, look at our antics. We're just, look at us. You know, we're just trying to play our role. Ha ha. Yeah. Like, Instead this of the like, whole, I'm, I'm actually I'm not nice. demon. Yeah. I'll never be nice. <laughs> it's so. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, the point of this wall slam is so no, that it's so funny to uh-huh. me that like the person who watched this, the thing that they focused on was like, oh, but this slam was so gentle. <laughs> It really goes to show that different people watch things differently. It's true. Different strokes for different folks. So yeah, uh, the point of this is for, like, Mary Hodges to show up and be like, uh, hi gentlemen, sorry to break up an intimate moment, but can I help you? Like, ugh, I'm bored, I'm bored. Just stop trying to get the gay dollar, Neil Gaiman. Like, you've already clearly got the gay (laughs) dollar, you're taking away the gay dollar right now. Ugh. The only fun part about this part is when, like, both of them are, like, still up against the wall and they turn to look at her. And Aziraphale just looks, like, bored. So, like, yeah, I mean... Yeah, he's like, he's like this is a common occurrence. Yeah, this, this is show. just how it is. Like, yeah, I mean, does he just like saying this to, like, get Crowley riled up so that he can get wall slammed occasionally when his spank bank is running low? Like, what's the deal here? Basically, Crowley immediately hypnotizes her to ask her questions about the Antichrist. Um, he does a silly voice at some point. I like it when he does a silly voice. Um, but yeah, they just learn there's no information left. All the records were destroyed in the fire. We're fucked. Goodbye. And Azir. What's funny is, like, I find it so funny that, you know, Azir Fail was like, Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You could have just asked her. Mm-hmm. And like, whatever, whatever. And in full awareness that this lady is hypnotized and wouldn't remember any of this at all, he still like does the whole like, okay, I'm going to collect myself so I can put on a pleasant <laughs> facade. And then he goes, um, and then he smiles and he goes, hello. And he's like, yeah. it's so cute. Oh, he's it's very, so... very cute. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess the other fun moments are when Aziraphale says, luck of the devil, and Crowley, like, double takes and look at set, looks at him twice, like, what a tasteless joke you've just made here. Also, when the nun says that the baby had lovely little toesy woesies, Aziraphale gives such, like, a benevolent, indulgent a smile. smile. Yeah. 
It's very cute. And then when he unhypnotizes her, um, he says, you will wake having had a lovely dream about whatever you like best, which obviously fan fiction writers have really, really taken and run with. What do you mean? Oh, just like Aziraphale does the you'll have a nice dream about whatever you like best thing to Crowley and then Crowley's like fucking him in the dreams, obviously. (laughs) But. (laughs) Okay, great. Anyway, so yeah, the police show up. So they head out past all the cops and the people shooting at each other. It's just they won't be able to find the Antichrist because he would have a natural camouflage. We have a thing where Crowley calls them both occult forces and Azir feels like, I'm not a cult. Angels aren't a cult. We're I'm ethereal. ethereal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are, baby girl. Love that for him. Do you think Aziraphale, like, do you think the coquette girlies would love Aziraphale? I did describe him as coquettish during the paint <laughs> scene. <laughs> which I think is a new addition for the the show in the book he just says oh but i'd always know the stain was there underneath and then crowley is like i don't gaff did i say that right <laughs> i think it would be funnier if you said i the gaff I, okay you know? crowley goes i did gaff and they just move on but yeah i mean there are, yeah there are definitely ways in which i would use coquettish to describe a zero fail at points in this episode they're panicking It'll be the war to end everything, etc. We have a brief scene of Anathema working, and we just have to have the narration line being, most books on witchcraft will tell you that witches work naked. This is because most books on witchcraft are written by men. Neil Gaiman, you are also a man. <laughs> also, you wrote a short story that was adapted into a comic called The Problem of Susan, where Aslan the Lion and the White Witch, like, have sex on screen. So, like, I mean, that's, like, not really anything, but, like, it just feels relevant to him writing this line. Once more, Aziraphale's talking about how there's a feeling of love to the whole area. It's- because book fact, what happens is that he explains this to Crowley- and Crowley's like, I, what? I don't feel anything. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a part where, there's a part where Zero feels like, oh, I can't explain it any better, especially not to you. And then Crowley goes, do you mean like, and then they hit anathema. Um, but in the, in the huh. show, Zero goes like, oh, I'm surprised that you can't feel it also. Which is different from the, like, oh, well, I don't think you're capable of sensing love in the book. And also, but also, like, the Crowley saying, like, do you mean, like, does, in the book, does haunt me forever? What was the end of that sentence, Crowley? But in, in the show, it's just, like, last thing we need right now is, and then they hit it. So it is less, it has less space for interpretation there. They hit Anathema on her bike. Poor girl. She, like, breaks her arm, but, like, Azurafail basically, like, commands there to be light. And then fixes her up. And, like, fixes her bike. And, like, it's a whole thing where at every single turn, like, Crowley's like, no. <laughs> and then, like, Azurafail is just like, like, basically it's like, um, he fixes her up. And then he goes like, oh, so where are you going, young lady? And... Crowley's like, we're not going to give her a lift. And <laughs> as was like, you did hit her. Like, you did hit her with your car. And he's like, yeah, but we don't have a bike rack. And then Azurafail manifests a bike rack. With tartan straps. Yeah. And like, what's so funny? Like, did you find this also absolutely hilarious? The, the soundtrack? The, like, the bicycle? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, bicycle. No, the bicycle, bicycle by Queen starts playing really loudly yeah, as Anathema is in yeah. the car, staring at the bike, going like, <laughs> "Hey, my bike didn't have gears before this." Because Azirfield did a too good job fixing it up, and you know Crowley says mockingly, "Oh Lord, heal this bike," which is fun. They're so fun. Yeah. The music cue really was so fascinating. Yes. The use of Queen in the show is excellent. Yeah. I like that 
I like the music choices that they make in this show. Like, are they doing this because they're British? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're just a popular band for sure. Yeah. Um. Well, book they facts. Are also British. The thing is that okay, basically Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett had like a joke going on where they were like. Any CDs left in a car for more than two weeks will just turn into the best of Queen because they found that, like, they both had a copy of that in their car even though they don't remember buying it. So, like, Aww. all of Crowley's CDs also are just Queen even if they they say something else and he puts them in. They're still Queen, so I think that's just... Queen was a big part of the book because, I, I don't know, I guess because you're right, because they're British and because they're a famous band. So... Yeah, yeah, they they are in the soundtrack a lot. I wonder how much money they blew on this. So, they take Anathema to her cottage, and when she leaves, she drops the book in the car next to a tartan Ooh. tin, which um Neil Gaiman has said on Tumblr. Oh, I'm. What's a tartan tin? Oh, like sorry, it's like a tin of like food but like the pattern on it is tartan which is a zero fails thing am i what what is that supposed to mean just that like it is it's not crowley's thing it's like a zero fails thing like oh, item in the it's car. Crowley's car yeah. yeah okay uh neil has said on tumblr that it is like a box of shortbreads that crowley or that a zero fails put in the car for them to snack on if they get peckish, which I think is very cute because it's like uh, their it's car. Funny. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. I love the term peckish. I it's also so love British. the term peckish. You know, Azarevels changed the the bike back, and they head off. Crowley goes, "Can we get on? Get in, Angel." And as you already know, yeah, I think that was this. <laughs> I think this is nice. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I hope we all die forever and also live forever. That's true. What happens in the book is that when Anathema first gets into the car, she's, like, afraid about getting in a car with two men at night. So she warns them that she has, like, a bread knife that she is willing to use if necessary. And then when she heads off and she hears Crowley say, Get in, Angel. She thinks, oh, I was perfectly safe the whole time. Because <laughs> she thinks that they're in gay love with each other. That's pretty sweet, <laughs> I think. <laughs> like, I mean, I feel like it is just, like, another component of the, like, isn't it so funny that people think they're gay thing. But, like, it is nice. <laughs> it is it's nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm, yeah, because I care about things that I wish I didn't care about. You gaff, yeah. <laughs> I need to stop this bit. But, you know, like, I'll continue it for the rest of this episode. And then you'll and find then you a new thing next week. Say the gaff ever again, yeah. <laughs> she calls her mom, and it's just like, I can't find him, blah, blah, blah. Holy shit, I lost the book. Oh, no. Aziraf and Crowley are now at a cafe. Once more, like, Crowley has, like, a coffee, but no food, and Aziraphale is yeah. delicately eating it's a cake. having a full meal, yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, you know how I feel about that. Okay, I take back the full meal. It's a yeah. cake, yeah. Aziraphale's idea is that they should get another human to find him, because humans are good at finding other humans. And Crowley just goes, he's not human, he's the Antichrist. <laughs> I think there is some truth to the whole, like, maybe they'll probably find him better. Are we supposed to assume that the kid is shielded from everyone? Or just the occults, as Crowley puts it? Sort of just everyone, I think. Or everyone, okay. Yeah. Because, like, I suppose maybe Anathema would find him easier if he wasn't cloaked from everyone. Right, like, her, her instruments aren't working. Crowley says that Crowley says that he has an automatic defense thingy and that suspicion slides off him like whatever it is, water slides off. And Aziraphale <laughs> I love gets this too, as well. his bitchiest moment where he goes, Got any better ideas? Or one or single... One? Better, better idea <laughs> and then he so at country, the end I of that it. he sort of like dabs his mouth delicately with his napkin as like a we're done here gesture which yeah 
definitely served cunt. And he will never die. And he will never die. And he will burn in this movie theater. So, um, the next scene is basically, like, um, Adam's parents are talking and they're like, Oh, why do we let him keep the dog? And it's like, oh, because, you know, it's like they're made for each other. And, um, his mom checks up on him. It's like, just a normal scene. I don't yeah. actually know what they're trying to do here. Well, like, what are they when, trying to I think it's because after Adam falls asleep, there's like voices whispering to him. Are there? Yeah. All I knew was like there was a dog, and like he actually kept the dog inside. And yeah, so it's like yeah, blah blah blah. He's a naughty kid or whatever the fuck. And then there are voices whispering to him. He's and eleven. Like, yeah, I think he's fine, but I don't know. His parents are being normal parents, which means that they're being more strict than I think parents should be. Well, first of all, he has a keep out sign on his door yeah, and his just mom didn't walks even in. knock. Yeah. I don't know if it's very, you know, don't do that. Yeah, agreed. But other than that, they're normal parents. He's a normal 11-year-old, you know, yeah. they're having a normal time. Yep, sure are. Aziraphale and Crowley are talking again in the Bentley and both of them shiftily are like you know I have a network of highly trained human agents that I could send searching for the boy and they both have one but they don't think that they should work together because they're not very sophisticated and then as- I, th- this comes up for sure right? Yes. I do wonder what the hell Crowley <laughs> Means by like, they're not, not very like he used to work. Sophisticated, words. politically speaking. <laughs> what does that mean, Crowley? What does it mean, Crowley? I'm so curious at what the fuck it means. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And Zero feels like, okay, let's do that. Unless you have a better idea. And Crowley goes, ducks. What about ducks? They're what water slides off. Oh, I love it when characters have ADHD. Do you, do we think that um they for sure like speak other languages, right? Yes. Doesn't Aziraphale speak Japanese last episode? Uh episode? yeah, to the sushi chef. I find it like Why did they pick English? Yeah, I mean, first of all, yes. But also like the whole like, you know, multilingual blah 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 mm. is very fascinating to me. And it's something that, you know, I wish like in media where they have like an ethereal being as uh, as Raphael puts mm-hmm. it, who knows many languages. I wish they did more bits about like what it's like to be multilingual. Yeah, because that's something I feel a lot about. Aww. Like, I mean, frequently I would say a phrase that actually only works in Tagalog, and it's like, oh, okay, well, whatever. And sometimes I would think of a word and it's like, well, I cannot remember it in English at fucking all. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, stuff like that. And like this scene, I was like, (laughs) oh, he's just like me for (laughs) real. He forgot the English word for duck. He's so real for that. he is. And then when he drops his ear fell off, he goes, you know, if you lined up everyone in the whole world and asked them to describe the Velvet Underground, nobody at all would say Bebop. I think this is just so fun. He's like, it's the end of our day together. Let me look back through the transcripts and, like, tie up any loose ends. <laughs> he was choosing his best line in his line, and this was his worst line. <laughs> For fucking real. But yeah, I don't know. I like that he's sort of distractible or is like chewing on earlier things for hours. Like, it's a fun time. His brain is just the like The world is going real. to end in two days. I guess. Mm, and then he notices the Book of Prophecies in the back. He's like, okay, what do we do with it? Blah, blah, blah. Azir fails, to, he notices what it is and he goes, Oh, holy shit. And he just grabs it and he's like, um, I have to run super fast. Uh huh, uh huh. And Crowley's like, Are you okay? And Aziraphale goes, Perfectly. Yes. Tip top. Absolutely tickety boo. Mind how you go. <laughs> and then he's just off. 
I love that he's a terrible liar and yet he's managed to fool heaven for 6,000 years. Also, Crowley says he doesn't read books. I think Crowley's probably like an audiobooks girly or something. So we learn that Aziraphale has a copy or has a collection of books of prophecy. And this is like the prized thing he's always been after. He opens the book and there is a prophecy that's like when the angel reads this, like, first, the world's super gonna end. And also, open thine eyes and read, I do say, foolish principality, for thy cocoa doth grow cold. And Aziraphale is, I just don't know what it is about this these prophecy books that makes, like, everyone around them stupid. But Aziraphale's like, thy cocoa doth grow cold? Huh? And then he turns and sees his cup, which has a little angel wing handle, by the way. And he goes, oh, That's <gasps> cute. <laughs> I just... It is so stupid. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm glad Michael Sheen's going full in on playing gay with that gasp, but, like, what was the, Why? And, okay, this just feels especially odd. Because, like, this is the scene in the book where the narrator has the introduction of Aziraphale where they explicitly call him, like, intelligent and then talk about how he's, like, been able to work through the prophecies really, really well. This is also the scene in the book where... Should I just read the whole thing? Everyone's heard this one already, but, you know, the one that goes, Many people meeting Aziraphale for the first time formed three impressions. That he was English, that he was intelligent, and that he was gayer than a tree full of monkeys on nitrous oxide. Two of these were wrong. Heaven is not in England, whatever certain poets may have thought, and angels are sexless unless they really want to make an effort. But he was intelligent, and it was an angelic intelligence which, while not being particularly higher than human intelligence, is much broader and has the advantage of having thousands of years of practice. Many people have made the joke that this show has decided that the ones that were wrong were the intelligent and in English intelligent. part. <laughs> yeah. Because the thing is, he is, in fact, gayer than a tree full of monkeys on nitrous oxide. <laughs> Ah. But, wow, the book really said things. Yeah. I mean, this episode is so long, I don't want to get into why I hate the they were sexless things so much. But, I mean, I don't know, you guys get it. Like, genitalia, you don't need genitalia to be gay, and the fact that it's like, you he can't be gay because he doesn't have a dick is like the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, so yeah, he's reading... The prophecies, we see some of them, etc. etc. And then we have like passage of time where he's just pouring over the book. And then Crowley calls, asking about updates. Azir feels like, What? No, no, there's nothing. There's no news. If I had anything, I would tell you, obviously, immediately. We're friends. Why would you even ask? And Crowley just takes this fully in stride. She's just like, Oh yeah, I mean, I don't have anything either. <laughs> Which, I think it's nice that Crowley has never developed a sense of, like, distrusting Aziraphale. You know what I mean? Like, this is obviously yeah. suspicious, but Crowley's just like, I mean, why would Aziraphale lie to me? It's not like he's, like, done it much before. Like, we're fine. Like, we have a healthy relationship. He's probably just anxious about the world ending. And, you know, when Crowley's like, call me if you find anything, Xerophil's like, absolutely! Why do you think I wouldn't? What a dork. So he reads a new prophecy that sort of, like, points him towards a potential phone number for Adam's house, because it's like, blah blah blah, number of the man, 666, Tadsfield, area code, whatever, whatever. Or Tadfield, sorry, I don't know why I keep saying Tadsfield. He has a rotary phone, it's so cute. So he calls, Mr. Young picks up, and then he hears Adam through the phone going, hey, look, I taught Dog how to walk on his hind legs. And that's another line in the prophecy. And, like, he goes, sorry, right number. And he hangs up. And that's, that's the episode. 
Okay. Oh my god, we need to do predictions. Yes. Okay. We we've decided okay. to structure our ending a little better. And part one is Gray's predictions for future episodes. So I've already said the Bentley spoiler I got. Mm-hmm. I also got another spoiler, but I did write this predictions before I found it. Um, earlier today, I um, wanted to read the prophecies of um, Agatha Nutter. Mm. And I found out that um, there's like one that's like Anathema and Newton will only sleep together once. <laughs> So I was like, oh, okay, one of my predictions is right. Well, like, one, Anathema would try to harm Adam in some way. Okay. And, like, I think Aziraphale and Crowley would, like, try to stop her. Okay. I think, honestly, like, the whole, like, Adam thing would be, like, but he's a, he's just a kid and he's a good kid. Like, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. One thing we know about Adam right now is that he is well loved. He's well loved by his parents and he's well loved by his friends. Mm-hmm. And I think like my next prediction is that the power of friendship will save the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can you stop making that <laughs> noise? <laughs> it's making me so nervous. Okay, I will talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, power of friendship, power of family, power of love, whatever. And also, I think maybe like Zero Phil and Carly will take care of this kid. I think maybe I don't know. And my second prediction, well, those are my first two predictions. My next set of predictions is that Anathema and Newton will definitely meet and maybe fall in love. Mm. So, and then the next one is like, I think like uh, the apocalypse will happen anyway, and instead, even though like even if Adam doesn't do anything to actually start it. I think, like, the whole point of the apocalypse is, like, it's not about him. He's, he's like, another vessel instead of being the actual plot. And I think maybe that will f- line up nicely with the whole, like, Azurophil and Crowley. Or just, like, doing this is, like, they're just playing a role. And, like, Adam will be in will have like that kind of thesis in some way um you know what what ends up what will end up happening is he actually is the one to stop the apocalypse which i think i got a bit of confirmation for that from the bentley spoiler Mm. yeah neat i i don't have any i feel like i need to do like predictions next time that are more specific like i need to go agatha not there like Agnes and then in nineteen eighty, yes. and uh, up, oh yeah, Ag- <laughs> why I keep calling her Agatha? I'm so sorry, but yeah, I need to go Agnes. Not their next episode where I just go like <laughs> next episode. Um, Apple will release <laughs> a new device that will change the world as we know it. But yeah. so true. Yeah, good predictions in terms of like I can see where you got them and they're interesting. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Okay, well, our next segment is Gayest Moment. Really? When did we agree? We did- I have segment. the fucking receipts. Let's go look through our Discord. Our next segment is Gayest Moment and Transest <laughs> Moment. Have to remember, you have to remember that when we were deciding on this, I was watching the next episode, and I was like, okay, okay, okay. I mean, you, you can do it the entire time, because I was too busy watching. Okay, the, I think the gayest moment. Well, I know your answer, and it's the, it's the blowing on the coat. I mean, right? I I might I might put get an angel as the gayest moment, just because it's very important to me personally. I don't know. Mm, yeah, I I guess this is a difficult segment Maybe to do not. when you aren't <laughs> when you don't necessarily ship them. <laughs> Maybe they're not gay. Have do they? Do they have a Maybe, solo you know, gay we... moment? I feel like every moment Aziraphale's in is a gay moment. I think Aziraphale is such a. He is the moment. Like I don't know. I yeah. He is the moment. I I I don't know. I quite like the. I do like the angel line quite a bit. Like when he said it, I was like, "Well, that's kind of that's that's uh, <laughs> that's sweet." I wouldn't say I don't ship them, but I also wouldn't say that I do ship them. Yeah. That's valid. Yeah, it's just they are what they are. They are what they are. Transist moment. 
I have no idea how to answer this. <laughs> Uh, the trashiest moment of this episode is when I watched it. It's true. Good point. Yeah. I mean, if we had the book, I would say that the trashiest moment is when Crowley returns it's of course that. Yeah, yeah. to her form. Man, I don't know. We didn't get to do this last time, so can I just carry over episode one, the fact that that kid's named Warlock is a transist moment? I <laughs> No, for real. <laughs> Everyone's gonna think that kid's transgender. Yeah. Good for yeah. him. Going by Wensley Dale. Yeah. Going by Wensley Dale is pretty trans. I have said, I, as I have said, I have attempted to do this in my life. And you know what? Me and him were just like each other for real. Yeah. Let's let's rate this episode out of 10. Gray, what, what is your rating for this episode? I think um this episode is fun i had fun i like the way it ended i like the cliffhanger whatever whatever i like the characters introduced but as i've said earlier it does take a while to get going Mm -hmm. and it does set up a lot and a lot of the setup a little bit tedious so i would give it an eight out of ten still a good episode not as good as last time could be better i'm hoping for better yeah uh, I also feel like this was a step down from the pilot, but still enjoyed myself a decent amount. I think some of the jokes were less good than the previous, and I enjoyed meeting the human characters, but I feel like they just don't really get to be much deeper than their gimmicks. So I I'm hovering between a 7 and an 8, but... I feel like I feel like to leave room for things that are in between these two episodes, I'll give it a seven. Because you said we have to do whole numbers only. Yeah. Alright. Wait, you um you don't think they go beyond their gimmick for this episode or like in general in the show? Well we'll have to see, I suppose. Okay, I guess we'll have to see. Yeah. Oh, by the way, apparently season uh, episode one and two are both eight point zero on on IMDb. Huh. So like the same. Which is interesting to me. They have the same like rating. Exactly the same. See, episode episode three is an eight point four. Oh, don't don't look at that. Don't look at anything. I'm not, okay. I'm not looking. I'm not looking. I don't. I didn't even like click on it so I can read the so I can t- read the okay. synopsis, but. That's interesting. It's better than the first episode. That's fun. I'm excited. I am also excited. And I will watch it immediately after we have Good. Up, so. That's it for this week's episode yeah. of Rubbish and Probably a Podcast. Next time, we will be talking about Season 1, Episode 3, Hard Times. Gonna make you... Anyway, so it's called Hard Times. Leave us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. You know the song Hard Times by Paramore, right? Of course. Is it based on that? No, it's not based on that. It's just the name of the episode. Okay, so follow us on social media. We interact through the account set up for our Supernatural Commentary Podcast, Bus the Asian Beauty. So we're on Tumblr at bustheasianbeautyspot.tumblr.com. And you can email us at bustheasianbeautyspot at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who's donated to our Kofi at ko-fi.com slash bustheasianbeautyspot. See you guys next time. Bye. Sorry, my alarm that makes me do 10 math problems before it turns off has suddenly <laughs> turned on, so I need a second. Um, <laughs> apologies, I did not turn all the correct ones off today. I do also want to say that Lot's wife, Ruth, mm-hmm. is... That's a Sodom and Gomorrah story, right? Yeah, yeah. She was yeah. asked not to turn back, and she did, and she turned she into did. salt. She did. She turned into a pillar of salt. So it goes. So it is. No, it's so it goes. So it goes so it be... To... Or no? It's, it's a reference to Slaughterhouse-Five. Oh. 
Sorry. He talks about it in Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I this love. Is a, a cousin yeah. Greg while you moment. solve. Yeah. While you solve your thing. Oh, I I finished just now, so oh we're my good. God. But okay. what's your thing? No, I just wanted to say that I love the religious aspects in Slaughterhouse Five so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. He literally um, bought a stethoscope to listen to Jesus' heart. And the son of God was dead as a doornail and five foot tree. Oh, 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 it's so good. Anyway. I barely remember anything about that book. <laughs> I read it on your heavy recommendation and I was like, Yes. It was and fine. And then <laughs> that was it. You the gaff, as the kids like to say nowadays. What does that mean? Like, you don't give a fuck, like, you the guy. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, got it. Those yeah. are the letters, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh my god, sorry, I'll find it, I'll do it, I can do it. You can do it. Bob the Builder. Can we fix <laughs> it? I don't, you know, this means, <laughs> that reference means absolutely nothing to you, but it is the funniest thing to me. What what it's a reference like, to? I know about it's a Bob reference the Builder. To, it's a reference to an NCT 127 song that like uh-huh. became a meme kind of, and it the song is called Time Lapse, and the chorus is Can we fix it, baby? Can we fix it or fix it? And there was this like edit from like last year or something, where it they edited like Bob the Builder. Uh huh. Can we fix it? <laughs> like the song so it's like Bob the Builder can we fix it <laughs> and, I, and nice. in my head it plays constantly literally Bob the Builder can we fix it something that people should know about me and probably already do if you listen to our other podcast I like to have things that the characters I like also have mm-hmm. so like time I to have buy a, a vintage Bentley that- yeah no really though i mean like i have um a ring that dean winchester like that looks pretty much exactly like dean winchester's ring and a coat that looks like his leather jacket and also like if anyone is thinking know, about I- watch of uh, <laughs> listening to bad pod know that i don't like dean so if that's putting you <laughs> off right like now <laughs> i don't even like you that much but like I don't know, like, I saw this car and I was like, well, I gotta have it. Um, I mean, Tenet it's, and it's, Sheen it's have both talked about how it's incredibly difficult to drive on set, so... Oh, of course. Perhaps, I is mean, it worth it? It's from 1926. It's yeah. absolutely not, but I don't want it. You know, I also considered buying a watch recently. <laughs> because because of House, from House MD. <laughs> But yeah. it's so insanely expensive, and I'm not doing that probably yeah. ever. Yeah. What was it? Like a $780 watch is his watch? Yes. Crazy. Crazy. I mean, he needs one because he's a doctor and he needs it. It can be a bad watch or a cheap watch that's, that's not true. bad. Maybe one day I'll buy a Tom Ford perfume <laughs> for Crowley's. Style. Even though we have no clue if that's yeah. what she wore. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> even though I just assumed that he wore st- he wore Stumford perfume. Yeah, I mean you're so correct. I'm assuming. Yeah. Sorry, I have to drink water. <laughs> I don't. Do I really sound like that every time I drink water? I mean, not right now. Actually, not right now. But every single time in the past, I do vividly hear the ug <laughs> ug. And at this point, every time you drink water, I just do it by virtue. I understand. Okay. And also to... Do you hear that? No. There's a super typhoon right now. Oh! <laughs> and the, the... The... um The... What's the English? Uh, the, the, the thunder is very uh, intense. Sorry, are you safe? Are uh, things okay? I am safe. I am okay. safe, yeah. It's okay. Good. Yeah. Um, we don't have any more trees to uproot. <laughs> <laughs> They've already got uprooted. <laughs> but anyway. Um... I mean, it, it could be a full meal in the gray universe. 
Yes. I to for context the other the last time we recorded, <laughs> I was like a morning for me and I showed up and I was like, Crystal, you gotta see my breakfast. Yeah. And I brought up my plate of breakfast and it was a hopia, which is like a mooncake here in the Philippines, a sweet one, two Twizzlers, and a a Reese's peanut buttercup <laughs> and a Snickers and like, fudge bar a Snickers brownie. Yes, a Snickers brownie and it's like almond dark chocolate and that was my breakfast <laughs> yeah to be fair it was like you know we were i was having um a, a rushed morning because yeah. i woke up late yeah. and i was gonna cook eggs but i was like you know what there are twizzlers in here so that's okay that's true twizzlers can be substituted for eggs 